The Light Prince of Legera. Protect, Preserve, and Populate. By Troy Maverick. Book 1. Chapter 1. Lucian. Dragonlord Placidusax had been kicking my ass last night, and I stayed up later than I'd like to admit trying to beat that hellish boss. Granted, all of my hours of hard work went down the fucking drain, and now I was late for my shift at my grandmother's cafe shop. Brush, wash, eat, repeat. Only this morning I would skip breakfast to make up for the four hours I missed at the register. Ahem. I was sure my nana wouldn't have a problem with it, seeing as I skipped the whole going to college thing to save her business a year ago. I had so much to look forward to, the world opened to so many possibilities for me. I was a 6 plus frame, lean and clean, engineering machine. And it was safe to say the ladies loved the guy who was triple stacked, nerdy, built, and attractive. Don't get me wrong, I was no Adonis, but I hadn't met a chick yet who was able to resist my messy brown hair, grey gentle eyes, and razor sharp jawline. But, like I said, I was bolted down to this lifestyle that had blindsided me. A year ago, my nana needed to save her business, and of course, I had jumped in and lent a helping hand. Helping around her shop wasn't something I planned on doing permanently. But, I was bringing in so many customers that she'd begged me to stay. Mostly women of course. From high school girls, to soccer moms, and, dare I say, feist the old maids from that nursing home two blocks down, I attracted all types. And it didn't help that my nana was super religious, or that she lived with me in my apartment. So no snoo snoo until I was married. Little did she know. In my nana's eyes, I was the purest grandson she could have asked for, kind, caring, and a total gentleman with a sailor mouth. Hey, something had to give, right? I wouldn't keep my grandmother waiting though, dashing out of our apartment with my apron in my backpack, running down to Giovanna's Cafe which was seven blocks down from our condo complex. We lived in the city of Syracuse in central New York where the roads were busy and the sidewalks even busier. I'd gotten used to the lack of space, the towering on top of people, and the ridiculous traffic. My nana said it hadn't always been this way, like, something crazy increased the population a little before I was born. The growth was irregular even for New York. She couldn't tell me what caused it though, no one could, and even though it had slightly decreased, I wouldn't know the difference unless someone who had been here longer told me. So I made my way down Berman Street using my elbow as a path sweeper, rushing as fast as I could to the cafe. I didn't mind the dense people, what I did mind was the strange surge and homicides that had started happening lately. That's what stopped my stride right in front of my nana's cafe, the rubber in my heels burning as I made a sharp stop right across the booth with the flat screen TV hanging over it. I couldn't hear much, but the visuals were clear enough for me to make out what was happening. The headlines sliding from one end of the bottom screen to the other read in big bold letters. Scorched unidentified body washed up to shore. Not the best news to have with your morning coffee or gin if you ask me, but this type of shit always made me feel a certain way. Especially seeing as this rise of homicides started jumping right after my mother had been murdered two years ago. About the same time my father went missing. I told myself to make nothing of it. It had become so common and regular that people stopped batting an eye to it. We became immune, tuning in just to see if the last location was close enough to where we were living. And if it were, we'd run extra high-end security and maybe board up our windows and doors. Sure ADT loved the back end of that. I zoned out to the news, someone's current crisis triggering my past ones. The fact that no one had been arrested or convicted of this trail of crimes was crazy to me, this scumbag targeting both men and women alike. Granted there were more male victims, but no one could connect the reason for that. I took one long unsettling sigh and squinted, my attention snatched by my grandma in the far background inside the cafe, waving her hands manically behind the counter. Shit, maybe I was in trouble with her after all. I waved back, being cheeky with her, even gave her a huge proud smile before I skipped in like Snow White just to grind her gears. Nana was so prune-faced right now. Where are my rabbits, chipmunks and birds to sip my morning cup of tea with me? I said in a pitched voice, acting exceptionally cherry with her while she fed me that mean glare. How about I give you a grumpy dwarf, Lucha? She fired, putting her hands at her hips. Eh, don't insult yourself like that, Nana, you're at least four foot ten. That back head slap, I deserved it. Super funny that she had to jump up to reach for it though. But I loved my little angry sassy Italian. Her attitude was spicy, her soul was sugary, and she knew her way around the kitchen. Hence, why I hadn't shoved her out of my apartment yet. Ha, nah, I was messing around, she was amazing. 
I looked up to her like my mother, my little old lady always out for me, ready to straighten me out, and choke me out too with her huge chunky hugging arms. Hurry up and get into the tapron and start busting that cash register. She barked at me in that charming accent. I did as I was told, looking at the dining room, noticing medium volume. And then I noticed something else, or should I say, someone else. Bada bing, that finest wine strawberry jam with extra filling. She was sitting at table 9 by herself, with that fat hardcover book over her eyes, pretending like she wasn't paying attention to me. My nana must have noticed me staring, walking over to me and whispering over my shoulder. You know, she been sitting there ever since he opened the shop, didn't order a damn thing. Yeah? I think she waiting for you. Three days in a row, now. She'd stalked me ever since I knocked into her that day on the street, picking up her jacket while I was running to work. I mean, I knew I was something to look at, but I was nowhere near her league. The girl was a total bombshell, with that long springy ginger hair, those amber eyes, and that hourglass figure that would have any straight man doing a double take. For some reason she found me interesting, interesting enough to wait in my grandmother's cafe for hours until I showed up. It wasn't until she got up off her seat, tired with all of that flirty back and forth glancing, did I notice the dress she wore. It hugged those delicious curves perfectly in forest green, the bottom of that number stopping only two inches off that bubbly ass of hers. Good morning. She greeted me, with a voice as soft and sweet as honey. More like good afternoon, now, I said with a cheeky smile. You are late. When am I not? I teased. Well, I don't trust anyone else to make my regular but you, tasty barista. Eh, are you calling me tasty, or your pink powerhouse latte? Hmm, maybe both. She flirted, my nosy grandma whistling when she made her exit to the back. I'm finding it hard to believe you waited all this time for me. You come this way for leisure? You can say that. It's not like I'm working. So, what do you do for a living? I asked, while preparing her drink behind the counter. She was noticeably older than me, but not by much. I was 20, so maybe she was like in her late 20s, early 30s? Didn't matter to me either way. I didn't discriminate, taking all types of women. She waited a bit before she answered my question, as if she had to think about it, leaning into the counter with that low-cut collar smiling at me. I tried hard not to stare, with a rack like that ready to hypnotize me. I'm a painter. She finally said. I sell art to the highest bidder. So, I guess you can say that I'm self-employed. Sounds like a good business for you to have enough time to be waiting for me at an old cafe shop, I jested. It pays reasonably well. I also like to do some figure art in my downtime. Are you interested in modeling? Me? Yeah, you have the body for it. She cooed, tossing me a raunchy look. My eyes grew, her distracting comment nearly making me overtop her latte. I pulled the blender jar away from her medium-sized cup, chuckling nervously at her compliment. Was she? Picturing me naked? That was what figure art was, right? A bunch of naked poses while someone else drew you? Should I take that as, you're not interested? I promise, it pays well. How about you take me out on a date first before getting me in my birthday suit? She giggled, hiding that shy smile behind her hand. Should I take that as a yes? I sang. Sure, you can take me out. How about tonight? I placed the lid on her drink and handed her the order with a straw on the countertop. Before she could reach into her purse I interjected, it's on the house. You know, for waiting on me. I smiled. And yeah, tonight is fine. She didn't seem thrilled about me taking her offer though, those amber eyes suddenly lost on my chest. Eh, that was a good thing, right? But she was a different type of lost, leaning into me while her eyes squinted hard. What is that? I looked down, noticing that she was distracted by my necklace. Oh, this? Something my old man gave me a few years ago before he... Um, left. Actually disappeared, around the same time my mother was murdered, but I didn't tell her that. I didn't want our first conversation taking a gloomy turn. It's... Beautiful. She sang, her hand dangling over it, almost like she was afraid to touch it. What's it made out of? The metal that looked like a spearhead with a yellow gem in it. Honestly, I didn't know. Hmm, maybe citron, wrapped with tungsten. Your guess is probably as good as mine. No, that's not tungsten. And that gem, certainly not citron. It looks like something out of this world. 
Almost like. I can see a whole other universe through. She stopped short, reeling herself back while she cleared her throat. What a lovely gift from your father. Um. She stuttered, an opening for me to give her my name. The name is Lucian, I said, always forgetting my name tag at home. She smiled sweetly, like she was overcompensating. Nicole. While her reaction to my father's gift was a bit off, it was nothing for her to feel sheepish about. I looked at it like any other piece of jewelry, my father begging me to wear it at all times. Didn't know why, and still didn't have a clue, honestly. But I abided by this strange law ever since he had given it to me. Under this wild superstition that if I took it off, something bad would happen. Thanks, Dad. Well, let me not keep your line up, she said, my head poking behind her, where nothing stood but air. I snickered. Sheesh, you could have thought of a better escape route than that. If you were sick of me already, you could have just said so. She chuckled. A sense of humor too. I like that. Nicole took her drink, then fished into her purse for a folded note. See you tonight, Lucian. She puckered up and blew me a kiss, and I got to watch that bouncy backside make it out the front door. I picked up the folded sticky note she gave me, Miss Nicole leaving this lucky barista with her digits. A Friday night was a great night to go out, too. Chapter 2 While I had a date for tonight, I didn't have a ride. At least, not one I was proud of going out with. I had my nanas beaten down, vintage, turquoise Ford Mustang. And unfortunately, that was the only car in the house. I'd have to take the bullet, because I wasn't trying to catch a rental for a date, not in such short notice. I got out of work around 7, staying a bit later to help close since I came in late. Once I got home, I washed up, got dressed, and then made out the front door. Of course my dear Nana stopped me right before my ass could even hit the hallway, giving me her talk about no misbehaving, and suggested that I stop by the gift shop for some flowers. Eh, this was a first date. While I was crossing my fingers behind my back about the sex, I wasn't about to lay it on thick by giving her some flowers. I gave my Nana a kiss and a hug before I dashed off, then headed to Nicole's place which was about a 25-minute drive from our condo complex. I was nervous the entire ride over there. I had made it my business to never drive this piece of junk, because I was afraid it would croak at any moment. This thing had a ridiculous amount of miles on it, and I was in no mood to get stuck on the road and have Triple A save my ass. Once I was parked in front of her place, this quaint little red townhouse in the middle of Perkins Street, I pulled out my cell phone and dialed her number. Hey, Nicole. I'm right out in front. I'll be down in a minute. Sure enough, she was down in exactly a minute. Well, that was different. Granted, I was usually a little late for my dates, so I guess she used that extra time wisely. She closed the door behind her, her dress code a bit fancier than mine. I was dressed business casual, while Nicole had a whole number on, the long nightgown with the double-slitted skirt, the matching black heels, and the flashy jewelry to finish up the whole look. Well, she was easily putting me to shame. I got out of the car, and compensated by being extra chivalrous, rushing to the other side to open the door for her. Well shit, I wish you'd told me we had a dress code. Good evening to you too, Lucian. Nicole greeted with a smile, giving me a light side kiss on my cheek. It's okay. You didn't need to go overboard. I always head out my door like this. So I guess the art business was booming for her, huh? Thank you. Her sultry voice said as she sat in my grandma's car, reaching for the seatbelt. I had a grin on me, from ear to ear, not only from that kiss, but from that nice cleavage shot too. Sue me. When I got back into my grandma's car, I pulled out, leaving the curb and putting on some light mood music. I had to admit, I was a little intimidated by Nicole now. She was finely dressed and had money, pretty much confirming that I was out of her league, but that wouldn't stop me from trying to win her affection tonight. Heh, you gotta excuse this old jalopy. Still saving up for my S model. S model? Tesla Model S, I explained. Right after my nana lets these bird wings fly. She looked at me concerned. Are you being imprisoned? I laughed. Ha ha, no, I'm helping her in the shop. I'm waiting for her to hire someone she calls trustworthy enough to take over my spot. My grandma is pretty picky when it comes to her business. She smiled. Hmm, wise woman, she said, making me turn to her as I drove down Wilson Highway before I noticed something on her face. It made me do a double take, tossing my finger over my lip, where I caught her attention. You got a little something at the corner of your lip, there. 
She jumped. I'm sorry. She said trying to laugh it off, my date taking a napkin from her purse over to her mouth. I just ate. Just ate? You mean, you're not in the mood for dinner? Because I was thinking about bringing you to, I must have lost my train of thought when I noticed that blood stain on her handkerchief. My eyes locked on her before something shining at me from the road pulled my attention back. Oh no, I can still eat. She said with a warm smile, and I tried to brush the whole thing off. It could have been jam or something else on her red lipstick, right? Whatever. Don't make a big deal about it. I ignored it and went back to focusing on her date. It's been a while since I'd last been at Rico's, this fine Italian spot my nana swore had the best eats in town. It was right up her alley, being a bit on the pricier side, seeing as it was a five-star restaurant. I had made a reservation for two, taking the last table available at the last minute. And seeing as it was a Friday night, I was extra grateful to have found us a nice spot to eat at. I parked my car out back, way back, so no one could see my grandma's beat-up whip at a place like this. Even though Nicole said she didn't mind, I did. After all, she could have just said that to be polite, seeing as she liked me, I mean, really liked me, slipping her arm around mine before I could even escort her out of the car. Well, I sure was feeling lucky tonight, thinking maybe after dinner in a movie, I could catch myself at her place for a gallery show. She had her hand on my chest when the host in the tux took my name at the front. He sat us down at our round table, right in front of the alfresco, where we got a nice scenery from the top floor's wall to wall windows. Our dinner ran smoothly, more of Nicole asking about me, and talking less about herself. For the most part, she wasn't much of a chatterbox, giving me short answers to anything revolving around her life and her family. I wanted to gauge what she was into, but it sounded like all Nicole really had going for her were the pieces she would sell to her clients. I didn't even have to impose by inviting myself to her place, Nicole beating me to the punch. She insisted that I see her portfolio in her art room, where I then made it obvious that I couldn't wait to see her skilled labor in person. But before we went back to her place, I wanted to show her a movie, followed by maybe a walk. Though when I had mentioned those two things she didn't seem as interested as I was. Shit, was she really that thirsty for me? Unless she honestly meant art room, I might have been in for a disappointment at the end of our date. After our sizzling appetizer, our entrees came in. She had a steak that was pretty much bleeding off that plate, and I had marinated Italian chicken with some modest sides. I got us a bottle of wine to go with our short meal, Nicole being a quick eater. I wanted to tell her not to rush, the girl wolfing down her food like we were spent on time. Soon after our shortcake and ice cream dessert, the check was made, and we went out to the movies. She said she liked westerns. The movies weren't as crowded as the restaurant. The line was also decent, giving me an ample amount of time to talk to Nicole some more. I gauged how she was feeling me, the girl never leaving my arm. She wasn't overbearingly clingy, just surprisingly affectionate for a first date. Not that I was complaining, I could say that she was just a bit tipsy from the wine, but she had been handsy with me ever since we stepped out of the car to eat dinner. Eh, Nicole, I said with a chuckle, getting all hot from her nibbling on my neck. Did you maybe want to skip the movies and head straight for a walk? I asked, being chivalrous about it. I didn't want to seem overeager, but surprisingly enough, she agreed to wait in line for the popcorn so we could start our movie. The movies. Definition, a bunch of heavy petting and some steamy making out. I gave in to my sex drive, her breath tasting like iron, probably from the raw meat she had earlier. Hell, Nicole was making it hard for me to keep my raw meat to myself. She was all over me, so I met her halfway. Don't ask me what that movie was about. I was tuned out, giving Nicole all of my attention, from her suckling on my neck, to those curious hands grabbing my junk over my pants. Luckily, we had the entire row to ourselves, and no one was behind us either. I think she had picked this old movie on purpose, so we could sit all alone, just me, her, and the other five people in this dark theater room. After the two-hour long makeout fest, I had her wait in the hallway while I took a bathroom break. I did my business, then stood in front of the faucet to wash my hands where I noticed her little love marks in the mirror. Shit. She left my neck red hot, with a cluster of hickeys I could play connect the dots with. I stretched out my neck, noticing it reaching further down my collarbone, before I heard a pair of high heels echoing my way. Toward the men's bathroom? I had to double check that I was in the right place, turning my head over my shoulder to spot a couple urinals. When the doors creaked open, I followed my instinct to jump into a stall, shaking my hands dry on my way there. My first thought was that someone had probably gotten lost, I never imagined it was my date looking for me. 
I recognized that lavender smell that wafted through, peeping my head under the stall door to see those black pumps heading my way. What the hell was she doing here? Did she not trust me when I said I had to take a piss? Lucian, her voice sang. Lucian, where are you hiding? I don't know, something was telling me not to respond. Not that it would matter anyway. I was made, Nicole springing the door right into me, forcibly making me take a seat on that toilet seat against the wall. Nicole! My voice broke. Lucian, there you are. He, yep, here I am. I gulped, that nervous smile on me unbreakable. I tried to be chill about this girl taking down stall doors to search for me in the men's bathroom, but nothing about this felt sensible. I was looking for you. She purred, locking the stall door behind her, with that lewd grin on her face. My face light up, beating myself inside for not catching on sooner. Was she in the mood for dirty bathroom sex? Well, you well, I did tell you I had to go to the bathroom, I said, being oblivious on purpose. I wondered what she'd do next, Nicole being incredibly unpredictable. As soon as she turned back to me, she gave my legs a nice straddle, leaning those delicious curves over my hips, with that venturous hand of hers over my nape. I can't wait much longer, Lucian. She purred, her love-drunk eyes on my lips when she started to grope me underneath my top. Our lips locked with more of that hard and heavy kissing she liked, Nicole trying to suffocate me with her tongue. She was giving me a goddamn boner from being so vigorous with it, grabbing my hair, moaning in my mouth, pressing her supple breasts against me. After that tongue war, she nipped my bottom lip with a tug that felt like she was trying to eat at me. My lips sprung back into my face, where I finally had a second to breathe. She was making me sweat, Nicole hiking up her dress skirt over her thighs while she fished for my dick behind that zipper. It wasn't the best position to be at with these tight stalls, but after all of that making out and squeezing me in the right places, she had me forgetting that we could get caught doing the nasty in a movie theater bathroom. Live for the moment I'd say, convincing myself we at least had a few minutes alone for a quickie. She whipped out my heart on with a gasp, Nicole getting excited by my size. She grabbed my cock, shoved her thong strap away with my head, and dove deep, my lips holding back a grunt from how incredibly tight she was. Shit, this quickie might end faster than I thought. Mum, Lucian. She poured over my neck, Nicole bouncing her squishing sex up and down my shaft like a slinky. I grabbed her thin waist and watched that low collar over her breasts slip, two jumping jugs flashing me for my viewing pleasure. Her pussy heat was making my leg numb and my chest heavy, Nicole still at it with my neck, until an innocent suckle turned into a bite. Granted it was probably a heat of the moment thing, but she didn't stop even after I flinched back a bit. Hey, heh, relax, Nicole, I said with a sheepish smile, taking her by her arms and gently pushing her off an inch. I'm not going anywhere. I'm sorry, Lucian. I got carried away. She moaned. You just get me so damn horny. She gasped, pounding against me harder. She was giving me goosebumps, that thirsty look on her making my chest tight. And this dick. Ugh, is. Is. Shush. You're going to get us caught. I tried to whisper, the elevation in her voice scaring me. But, it would be too late. I knew it was over once she started convulsing, her eyes pooling to the back of her head. Nicole broke, screaming right into my eardrums with a banshee scream. Her fingernails sunk into my shoulders, my date arching her head back and letting out an orgasm loud enough to stir the building's entire east side. She quaked, her pussy walls choking out my cock. Fuck me, Lucian. Holy shit, fuck me. She had to toss my name into the mix. Not a lot of guys in town with my name, you know? A couple of short labored breaths later, and all of a sudden, my senses went through the roof. It was only a matter of time before our audience steamrolled in. I'd take the loss, not getting a chance to catch a nut, because I wasn't about to get caught having bathroom sex in the stall. There was no way no one heard us, so I started to panic, scrambling to put myself together and rushing out of the bathroom with my grip around Nicole's wrist. While my other hand tried to zip my fly up. Of course, on cue, in came this random guy with a proud smile on his face, trying his best to hide that cheeky look while he cleared his throat. Yeah, it didn't look good with her coming out of that bathroom with me, the both of us looking like a hot mess. I was caught off guard, Nicole being my first date where we didn't even make it back to her place before we hit it. I pulled her aside, looking over my shoulder while I tried fixing my hair, letting Nicole recompose herself. Shit, babe. I snickered. Let's not do that again. She curled up to me, with one hand on my chest, and the other lingering over my belt. Lucian, you didn't like it? She purred. 
Okay, let me rephrase that. Let's not do that again in public. But that's what makes it fun. She giggled. It was raw, passionate. You had me all heated up in that showroom, I just couldn't wait anymore. She said with a whimper and a pout, and if I wasn't paying close attention, I would have missed her trying to grope my junk out in the lobby. I swatted her playfully, this girl's sex drive through the roof. So, I guess no walk? I grinned. Wanna head right to your place? No, I'd love a walk. She smiled. Eh, yeah. Maybe a walk would calm her down a bit. Chapter 3 After she had her Lucian fix, she took it down a couple of notches. For once, all we did was hold hands, with her head on my arm, the both of us appreciating the walk down the park. I didn't know what to make of Nicole just yet. But one thing was for sure, she was going to be super fun in bed. Oh Lucian, I had a great time. She said, just as we went across the bridge and into denser parts of the park. At this point, we might as well have been in the forest, the two of us, alone, where I couldn't help but feel like she was two seconds away from stripping me naked for park sex. She was giving me those sultry eyes again, though I was lost when that comment she had said finally clicked in my head. Had? I repeated. Does that mean you're calling it a night? Something like that. She grinned, a type of smile that left me with a bad taste in my mouth. My chest went tight, Nicole suddenly giving me strange vibes. You really should get going. But first, how about a little parting gift? A parting gift? If she was talking about a kiss goodnight, I felt it may be a little premature. I hadn't dropped her off at her place yet. Not only that, but after the night we'd been through, I found it odd that she felt like she had to ask. Though, the longer that unsettling silence hung over my head, the better I understood her random request. Her eyes were locked on my necklace. The same one I had told her my father gave me before he went missing. She slipped her fingers underneath it, leaning in super close, like she was ready to snatch it off my neck. It truly is precious, Lucian. She cooed, then looked up to me. Mind if your very special date took a very special look at it? You want me to take it off? Will you? I hesitated. Ugh, I don't think I can do that, Nicole. I've had it on ever since it was given to me. Not to sound cheesy, but my old man had said to never take it off. Not even for me, Lucian? She protested, standing on her toes, pulling in for a gentle peck on my lips. She was persuasive, yet, I couldn't fight the feeling I shouldn't. I was two seconds away from satisfying her itch before I changed my mind. Sorry, Nicole. But you can hold it from right here, I said, taking her wrist as politely as I could while I noticed her wrapping her fingers around it. How very sweet of you. She said darkly. If you don't want me to have your necklace, how about I have your blood instead? Not a single second to process what the fuck she just said. Immediately, I had a fight or flight moment, that strange aura from Nicole pressing me against the ropes. She grabbed me by my arms, those suck-happy lips of hers opening nice and wide, revealing fucking fangs. Her entire face morphed on me, Nicole turning into a monster and shoving me against that alder tree behind us. Where the hell did she get all of this wild strength from? I couldn't even peel her off of me. She growled and grunted, that once pretty ginger latte girl warping into my worst nightmare. I'd say she was a vampire, but ten times worse, her eyes pooling red, her skin turning black and tarry. What freaked me out even more was how incredibly persistent she was to get at my neck, and she got her bite in two, my body tightening from the sting. At that moment, I felt my body shooting pains of regret. I swear, I'd never been more terrified in my fucking life. My adrenaline fired up, giving me enough strength to push her off. I fell on the grass in the process, my heart racing, that long vile tongue of hers hanging off the corner of her lip where I saw my snapped necklace. That was when I noticed exactly how much damage she had done. A chunk of my skin was wedged in between those jagged fangs, and when my hand went to touch my throat, all I felt was blood. Shit. I stuttered, feeling my vision going in and out before the pain of her bite overwhelmed me. She dropped on all fours, her body crippled by her bone-snapping transformation. My elbows on the ground pushed me upward, trying to keep her away from me. With every bulge of muscle and weight she packed on, my chest heaved and my breath rattled. Yet, I was horror-struck, denying this thing being responsible for all of those homicidal deaths in New York. Lucian! Where do you think you're going sexy? 
Her call, like scratchy voices that sounded less human and more demon. It scared the crap out of me, bringing me to my feet, while I tried to erase that image of her zombie skin ripping through from the inside out. I bolted, clenching my torn neck in my hand, trying to ignore the weakness running down my legs. There was no way in hell I was going to reach the street, her devilish laughter filling the woods as I crashed through shrubs and leaped over logs. I was panicking, the blood oozing down my throat slowing down my pace while Nicole drew closer and closer to me. Until I dropped, my foot tripping over a tree root. Fuck me. I used my arm to absorb that fall, my body aching from it. I should have known there was something up with her when I caught that metallic smell off her breath, and that blood drop at the corner of her lip when she had first stepped inside my car. Now I was her next meal, my body turning toward her, watching her fully transformed body towering over me from at least eight feet tall. All black, all skeletal, all after me. My gratitude. Her deepened voice thanked. Her arm turned into a huge hooked cleaver blade and brought my necklace over her face for me to see. I kept dragging my feet backward, asking myself what was so fucking special about that necklace. If I'd known she'd tear me apart for it. Ack, I coughed, fighting to stand myself up. But as soon as I managed to get on my feet, that cold hard blade went right through me. I made it too easy. Ah. I gritted, Nicole impaling me with my back facing her as I tried to escape. The pointed tip of her weapon swept in through my torso, where I did something as stupid as trying to shove it back out of my guts. But I didn't want to die here, I didn't want this to be where it all ended. Nicole must have noticed me struggling, I barely had enough strength at this point to even stand up. She finally pulled out, my blood spraying the forest in red. The back of my head struck the ground, where all I felt was regret, pain, and absolute fear. Blood relentlessly poured out of my body and my neck, suffocating my mouth. I was growing weak, my body dying, the monster who was about to take my life now casting a shadow as she stood over me. Hell, hadn't she done enough damage? What the fuck was she trying to do next? Ligerian Prince, Son of Light. What? I must have been hearing things, her voice muffled from my agony. I even started to hear the wind move, whizzing by sharply over my head, three, five, seven times over. Raindrops suddenly kissed my face, until I realized, those weren't raindrops at all. Nicole's blood. A line of arrows, unless my eyes were deceiving me. From her forehead down, she was covered in them, and where they penetrated, a flicker of light would follow. And then out of nowhere, someone behind us called out. I swear, she sounded like a fucking angel. May the power of the light consume you. Nicole's explosion was bittersweet. Chapter 4 I heard a rattling chain, the girl behind me probably picking up my necklace from the splattered remains of my horrific date. I caught her footsteps rushing my way, and I hoped that she hadn't changed her mind about bringing me to the nearest morgue. I was struggling to breathe, trying to pace my sharp breaths through my mouth, where all I heard was fitful gargling. I had swallowed enough blood to make me totally nauseous, but I had no choice, that bitch had sliced right through me twice. I was fading away, my body separating from me. It was true what they say about how life flashed right before your eyes at death, the images of my family bringing me some type of inner peace, my mom, my dad, my sweet nana. I wished I were able to see her one last time and tell her that she was right. Redheads were dangerous. The crunching leaves from the bottom of her feet amplified in my sensitive ears. Until she stopped right by me, where I caught a blurry image of the girl who had saved me from further bloodshed. She was. Attractively exotic looking, no taller than 5 feet 7 inches, with long white hair that fell into soft waves at the thick ends, large violet eyes, and a tight black spandex sports jumpsuit over her petite body. I couldn't tell if that was some type of vintage quiver she had strapped around her crop jacket, but it wouldn't matter, I wouldn't be seeing much of her soon anyway. When she quickly slipped my head on her lap, my vision only got blurrier, as if this white transparent film of light was blocking my view. The countenances of death were alarming, but I didn't make anything of it. Instead, I tried everything I could to turn around and thank her for trying to save me. At most, I gave her a faint cocky smile, her reaction taking me back. She blushed, looking down at me like she was fighting a smile of her own. The mystery girl placed my surprisingly intact necklace right back on me, and I could feel her fingers slipping along all that blood I had on my skin. She was unfazed by the brutality, which had the cogs in my head going. Any normal person would try to dial for help or something. They would freak out, maybe even pass out, honestly. But not her. 
She cradled me, her gentle fingers glowing as they ran down my midriff, tracing over my huge wound. Lucian. She whispered, her lips leaning over my face, giving me a parting kiss on my forehead. The fact that she knew my name didn't even cross my mind, distracted with her tenderness toward me. That smile I had finally waned down, a single tear streaming down the corner of my eye as my heart rate started to drop. I drew my hand on hers over my chest, trying to show her some appreciation before I died. But, I didn't. Her whole hand started to emit a warm yellow light, this swarming feeling washing over me. It was airy, almost feather light, but at the same time heavy and overwhelming. Until that feeling rippled, that warmth from earlier running through me and heating up my insides. Suddenly, this vivid bright light materialized before me, hovering in the air out of nowhere. It flinched into a square with refined edges and text listed inside, showing me a stats screen. Triggered, initiate healing process stats. Name, Lucian Reef. Race, Human Ligerian. Class, Kieran's Air. Role, N.A. Level, 1 Experience, 655 1000. Points to be allocated, 0. Agility, 4. Brawn, 5. Charisma, 48. Core Range, Searching. Health, 003100. Light Energy, Searching. Innate Light Specialty, None. Skills. Light Classes Learned, None. Items. Lights Core. What? In. The. I was hallucinating, my mind shot. I barely registered anything on that list that had just disappeared, distracted by the pain tearing through me instead. I clenched my jaw, and snatched the wrist she had on me. My body begged her to stop, locking up in muscle spasms. I jerked my head back, the feeling of my body going nuclear making me convulse. I had no idea what the hell she was doing to me, this was supernatural. Between my date turning into a monster and this nightmarish light show, I felt like I had already died and gone to fucking hell. I'm sorry, Lucian. Your wounds are extensive. She apologized. And your body isn't used to my healing yet. What the hell was she saying? I didn't understand any of it. Suddenly, this wave of energy snatched me out of nowhere, violent currents running down my body. The light she emitted seeped through me, coursing in my blood, my veins, my muscles, and just about every nook and cranny of my soul. I didn't know how much more of this I could take, praying there was an end to all of this torture. Ugh. I sat up with a gasp, spilling out a mouthful of blood. It was an involuntary reaction to choking, my body still coughing out my insides. I tried being decent about it, covering my mouth, and then my hand slipped down to my neck, where I noticed that the bite Nicole had left me was gone. Huh. My voice shook, my panting restless. I moved my hand south, realizing I had been sealed up from head to toe. The fuck just happened? I scrambled to my feet, still in disbelief. I must have patted my torso down over a dozen times, to make sure I wasn't seeing things. The tear in my shirt was there, but my body. Was. Lucian. She called, getting up on her feet as well. You have taken the healing well. Okay, that's odd. Why did that same screen just pop up again? Granted, it only lasted a couple seconds, but I caught my supposed health bar maxing out before it disappeared again. I didn't see the rest of the list, and I had no idea what the hell was going on, but I tackled my savior with the strongest hug I had ever given anyone. I took her by surprise, the way I wrapped my arms around her, feeling her chin hang there against my collarbone. My little guardian angel. She didn't hug me back, but her heart was racing, and I could tell I had either made her nervous, or I'd left her stumped from my abrupt show of gratitude. I didn't give two shits either way, I was determined to show her how appreciative I was for her helping me. Thank you. I whispered softly, feeling her body warm up the longer I continued to hold her close in my arms. Um. She started, and I broke from her, hanging my head low bashfully. Heh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable, I confessed, scratching the back of my head. No, it's not that. She stopped short, chewing on her bottom lip, stroking her arm sheepishly. You are welcome. Her face darted away from me, the girl trying to hide her blush. Finally, I could feel a little relaxed around her, enough for me to start asking her some questions, like, hey, while I'm grateful and all for the save. I have to ask, what the heck did you do back there? Pardon? That crazy light show. Did you really heal me? It's my light warrior's gift. Come again? I am a natural healer of the light, and a warrior in your father Kieran's kingdom. Shit, just exactly what was in that wine bottle. 
Was I hearing things? Did she really just say that she was my father's warrior? My father, who had a, and I quote, kingdom. My name is Kahaya, but you can call me, Kai. Well, that would explain how you know my name. Seeing as you know about my father. I chuckled, but that comment made her clear her throat. Well, how else did she know my name? Still, all of this feels like one big gag. You mean, as in a joke? She said, furrowing her eyebrows at me. Nothing about this is a means of getting you to laugh, Lucian. Your life was in actual danger, and it still is. All the more reason to keep that necklace on. That woman you were with was a shadow elf, and you need to. Whoa. Heh, I need you to slow down a bit there, Kahana. It's Kai. She corrected. I chuckled nervously. Yeah, right. Look, Nicole was my date. That monster she transformed into, I'm still trying to work that out in my head. So please, don't start talking sense into all of this. I am very satisfied with tossing this entire night into the back of my mind and taking my ass back home. Playing ignorant is one way of dealing with this traumatizing event. She said, her voice still surprisingly monotone and mellow in this situation. Or, you can hear what I have to say, and decide from there whether you want to go with me or not. I grinned. Go where? I asked, chuckling. Look, you're cute and all, really. And you saved my life. But, I don't think I'm going to go on any more dates for a longest time. That decision isn't for you to make, unfortunately. What? I paused, noticing her eyes looking overhead. I pivoted, witnessing the tall trees sashaying without wind. The sight came with the onset of chills, something eerie crawling up my spine. If you want to survive, I suggest you make a choice. To stay here, or, to come with me, where I can shine some light into everything your father expects of you. Shit, how do you know so much about my missing father? Lucian. She started as she grabbed my hand, looking into my eyes with a bit of tenderness and seriousness. I need your approval. Kai, you still haven't told me where we are going. Home. I hesitated, looking back at her confused. But then those dancing trees started to croak and growl, the sound of a stampede heading our way. Crap, if it was more of what I saw out of Nicole, I'd gladly exit, stage left. So I turned to her, a bit overeager, but I wasn't trying to get stabbed again. All right. All right. Take me home. And with that, something crazy started opening under our feet. It looked like a whipping wormhole, with a violent wind trying to suck us inside. It was glowing with the same shade of yellow Kai had healed me with, but the torrent was insane. I saw it stretch wide enough to swallow the both of us in, Kai taking me into her arms, ready to phase us. Chapter 5 Fall into a portal with a cute little number, let me cross that out of my bucket list. Not only was this not my home, but I wasn't even in the same state, let alone the same country. This just wasn't my night, it was weird, and it just got a whole lot weirder, god damn it, the sensation of having fallen into another world washed over me as soon as my feet hit the ground again. What I couldn't get used to though, was how it was about midnight a few seconds ago, and now the sun was hanging over my head, two times bigger and a whole lot prouder. As far as my surroundings went, yeah, I was in a palace all right, a massive one. Smack dab in the middle of an empty throne room, with Kai at my side, hmm, she looked even prettier with the sun hitting her gentle face. Giving me a nice little spotlight to the girl who just warped me to the twilight zone, she stayed looking at me with that conflicted face of bashfulness and seriousness. I think it was clear at this point the girl had a thing for me, but didn't want to make it too obvious. Besides, she had already kissed me, on the forehead, but it was still a kiss nevertheless. I wanted to make sense out of what she had told me, and even though I only left with her in the heat of the moment type thing, I felt like I had made the right choice, after all, she knew my name. And my father's as well. Welcome home, she said, that monotone voice on her growing on me. I know this wasn't what you were expecting, but this is where you will be stationed for now. All right, I think it's about high time you started explaining yourself, from the very beginning. I'm entitled to that much, don't you think? After all, you did just kidnap me. She stood her eyebrows up, confused. Kidnapped? Yeah, I said, giving her a cheeky look. You know damn well that this wasn't the home I was referring to. I apologize for being deceptive, but I had good reason. I didn't want to see you again like that. Like what? She lowered her head embarrassingly, and then, and there, I knew what she was referring to. Me, on the brink of death, with my guts hanging on the floor. Ah, right. I will gladly start from the very beginning. Great. 
I'm all ears. Like I mentioned before, my name is Kai, and I have brought you to our world, the planet Legera, in the kingdom located in District Rado. A little shaken up so far, but continue. I am your father Kieran's most trusted light warrior. My specialty is healing, with my extender being archery. I am also just one of his many generals in his broken army, as well as a second in command to his kingdom. Your father is known as a god in our land, making you a demigod. Aha, uh -huh, aha. Uh -huh. Our people stand for peace in the Ethereum galaxy, but where there is light, there sleeps darkness as well. They originate from the void, an anti-world of unknown origin and location that harnesses dark energies to contradict our light. You can think of the void as a black hole, but instead of holding life in, it spits life out. Anti-life, in the form of sentient shadow elves. These shadow elves are attracted to light, and seeing as your father is the god of light, he felt the need to protect Legera by luring the threat away from our planet. I assume he ended up on Earth decades ago, in the Milky Way galaxy, thinking that the Shadow Elps would stop terrorizing our people and crawl back to where they came from. While part of the issue was his very presence in Legera, his disappearance didn't stop the Shadow Elps from trickling in. First, in low numbers, then more recently, in amounts we found ourselves struggling to contain. Day by day, they started to take over, thinking us weaker without our god. They adapted to our resistance by taking on our appearance, and hiding in our skin so they can diminish our numbers. Many think they have a secret agenda, serving as informants against our god, Kirin. They evolved, becoming more aggressive, these higher class elves suddenly appearing to overpower us. That's when they staged a devastating attack against our people, and I can only guess what triggered the violent outburst. I narrowed my eyes on her, my finger against my chin while I prepared myself to question Kai. This attack, can you tell me how long ago was it? About two years ago. I gasped. We have been trying to recover from it ever since. Two years ago? That's when my father went missing. Like I said, it became very difficult to spot them, because they sometimes look like us, talk like us, and walk like us. It is part of their disguise, making it harder for us to detect them. Just like we can attract shadows, shadows can attract light. But in their disguise, we are unable to see them coming. She looked at me solemnly, the tone in her voice desperate. Lucian, the strike left our homes, our people, and our nation in a crippling need of a savior. And, we are praying that this savior is you. Me? What about my father? We don't know where he is. But you can imagine the grave situation we are in. These shadow elves, they made their way out of the Ethereum galaxy into yours in search of our god. That is what your date, Nicole, was. She was a shadow elf. And the reason they were there wasn't to find you, but to find your father, Kirin, our light god. When they came up short, they realized he wasn't the only one carrying this godly light. So they spotted you, and turned you into their target. That was what we nearly escaped, a horde of shadow elves ready to take your life and destroy a piece of the light king. Shit, anti-life, the void, light god, an attack, being hunted down in place of my father, take me back to my simpler life where all I had to worry about was beating the next boss in Elden Ring. Crap, I didn't know how to answer all of that. When she had started talking, I was ready to dismiss everything. Because, come on. It sounded crazy. All of it. And now, when things were beginning to make sense, when the timeline was coinciding with the events of my life, I had to give Kai a chance and tune into her craziness. But shit, me? A demigod? Since when? How? I had just been teleported and dished out the biggest assignment of my life. I had no idea where to start, or what to think. But Kai, I felt like I owed her at least my honest effort in all of this. She had just saved my life. How could I turn back around and brush off her and her troubled people? Which turned out, were my people as well. Ugh. I snatched my hair, agitated, Kai stepping back as she noticed my fit of anxiety. Ugh, there's no way any of this is real. Lucian, you don't believe me? Her voice softened, catching my attention. I froze, looking down to her conflicted, trying to gauge where that question was coming from. Well, I don't see a reason why you would lie to me, I started, rolling my shoulders back and trying to calm myself down. Honestly, if what you said is true, then I still don't understand why my father would disappear like that. To leave his planet sitting out in the open for punishment? I mean, yeah, I guess I get why, but... Why? Why not fight the good fight, stay with his people, and protect them? That would also mean that my father really didn't go missing two years ago. 
he had probably left somewhere. And, if he didn't go back Herod, then where the hell is he? No one knows how to track down the light god besides the void. Like I mentioned, the darkness is naturally attracted to the light. If that's the case, then how did you find me? I am a light warrior. She reminded me. My job is to protect people to the best of my ability. I stumbled on earth in search of your father, coincidentally. So when I sensed a shadow elp, I had a feeling that my king could be near. But instead of finding my king, I found his son, the prince. I chuckled. Please, just call me Lucian. I mean, the fact that my old man is a god is already a bit too much. She smiled mildly. Do you mean, Lucian, the demigod? Heh, <sighs> no, just Lucian. I'm nothing special, really, I said, then caught onto her jest. She was pulling my leg, but Kai had been so serious thus far that I hadn't caught on with her trying to break the ice with me. Lucian it is. So tell me, Kai, what makes me and my father's light so special? You have it too, right? With that whole healing business? Yes, I do. Everyone native to Legera can wield light in some fashion. Some of us are even born with specialties from our light, mine being the ability to heal others. You can think of light as mana, a magical power of sorts that we can bend in various and unorthodox ways. And your father Kirin is the instrument, or the embodiment of the sun spirit that channels the infinite power of the sun to all of Legera, making him our source of light. Which makes sense as to why the void wants to terminate the powerhouse of light across Legera. Is the light the only entity capable of stopping the void? I am assuming that these Alps are on a mission to take over the Aetherian galaxy, right? Correct. And if you take into account that godly light is also limitless light, then you can understand why they've been so persistent. The rest of us have a maximum amount of light we can expend before we need to rejuvenate via the power of the sun. Wait, wouldn't that make the sun the powerhouse? The void, they can just attack the sun, can't they? She snickered, whoa, two smiles. Something told me that wasn't common with this down to business, no nonsense girl, so I took that accomplishment to heart. Lucian, no one can destroy the sun. But the ability to terminate your father. She paused, phased by her comment. If your father gets captured and they somehow suppress his light or find a way to kill him, then all of us will be rendered powerless. He is the embodiment of the sun, making him the prime target. I froze. How the hell is that possible? The sun will still be there. Yes, but the sun channels its powers through Kirin's life source, and Kirin's life source alone. While we draw power from the sun directly, Kirin is still the embodiment of the sun. You might think your father's absence is neglectful, but he may be doing us a service by staying out of harm's way. Well, what about my powers? You said that I am a demigod, right? How the hell does that work? Do I have limitless light as well? Am I dependent on my father? It's hard to say if you're dependent on your father. As for your light, I believe it is limitless, just like Kieran's. But we won't know for sure until you wield your light. The hell? I've never done that before. Up until now, I've lived my life as a full-fledged human, not a demigod. Which, by the way, I thought gods were immortal. And you're saying my pops can get killed. The definition of immortality is perceived differently here. In Legera, our sun god is immortal in a sense that he is difficult to defeat. By regular means, he will not die. His life isn't completely limited by the properties of his vessel. Ha. Huh. Well, that's one thing he didn't pass down the family tree. As you already noticed, I would have been shadow food if it wasn't for you. Like you mentioned, Lucian, you haven't tapped into your light. Up until now, you've been living as a human, unaware of the potential you have as a light bearer. And I am sure that pendant around your neck will serve to help you in your mission here, and the path Legera expects of you. Chapter 6 what Legera expected of me, how did Kai know I was ready to go down that path? I continued pacing back and forth, with one hand stuffed in my pocket and the other scratching at the top of my head. I had to consider something here, saving an entire planet weighed a hell of a lot more than saving my life. Did I seriously know what the fuck I was getting myself into? Could I honestly say I had enough willpower to save an entire civilization? I mean, come on. There was a reason why my father didn't even bother fighting this thing and they expected me to do something about it. Someone only half as powerful as he was. Lucian, that necklace you have around your shoulders, it belonged to your father. It is called the Light's Core. It was a gift from the Sun Spirit, given to him at a very young age, thousands of years ago. Like you and I, your father had been born into a world, with a loving mother and father, pure and innocent, 
without a care in the world. Until these visions began showing him who he truly was, and his purpose in Legera was set in stone. That isn't to say that you don't have a choice. But your father, he passed down the baton to you. We expect you to take his place here and protect his people, master the art of light wielding, and to use your powers to the best you are able. It is your responsibility, just as it is mine, to mend our broken world. Not to sound negative, Kai, but unlike you, I have a hit on my head. I am an active target here, just like I was on Earth. Not only that, but you said no one knows where the hell these shadow elves are even coming from. No one has a clue where this void thing is. So even if I'd like to help, I'd only be putting my life, and yours, in constant danger. This isn't true. I am being targeted for being a warrior of light. My life is in danger just as much as yours by having these shadow elves living in my home and terrorizing my people. As for the location of the void, we will only know in time. All we can do is have faith. But there is. Something especially pressing about your presence here, Lucian. Something that is part of your godly duties. I straightened my head up, looking at her staggered. What is it? In place of your father. Well, she briefed, Kai finding it hard to finish her words. It was the first I'd seen her being so apprehensive, unable to even look at me straight. Kai, what do I have to do? Your father is expected to, in cases such as these, help reshape the world. I thought that was something we had already discussed. No, I mean, repopulate the world. I'm sorry, come again? Repopulate. She couldn't articulate that any which way for me to accept what she had just said. Repopulate? As in breed? Breeding the women of Legera. Did I catch that right? She allowed her chest to deflate, taking a deep breath out before she elaborated. One of Kieran's responsibilities is to repopulate the world when it has gone through a crisis. And this attack falls under that category. Many lives, as you can see in Rado alone, have fallen. Men are scarce, and our numbers are being crushed by these disguised elves in hiding. For all we know, there may be fewer of us left than we thought. The way you are expected to proceed in your father's place is by rank. In Legera, there are seven districts, or countries. And in each of these districts, you have barons. Their goal is to control the districts and the defenses within those districts as well, in accordance with the king. The social structure of Legera stands as is, the light god, his district barons or lords, his warriors and army, tiered wealth producers, and untouchables. Proceed? Am I really expected to swing my dick around the food chain, popping babies through noble ranks like some horrible breeding simulation? Well, that duty is exclusively for the sun god, but his kin must take his place in this matter. Is that a known fact? I exclaimed. It is, to the family of barons, at least. So, let me get this straight, you, Kai, warrior of my godly father, brought me, a regular Estos civilian from Earth, to not only protect an entire planet, but to provide, defend, and breed it. Yes, she said, as a matter of factly. I'm in no position to have kids. You won't be around to raise them. The mothers, relatives, and maids of the court are given that responsibility. A ticket to being a displaced father? This really was the Twilight Zone. Of course, this task is what is expected of you. But, just know if you refuse, you will be doing us a great disservice. After all, the idea behind this is not only to repopulate, but to also bring out stronger light bearers. Yeah, and I'm only a demigod, which, by the way, I'm still having a hard time accepting. It still counts regardless. And we will take all the help we can get. I sighed, scratching at the back of my head, conflicted. It's something to think about. Yes, it is a great burden, I suppose. Was Kai being sarcastic? She must really think that banging royalty was on the top of my to-do list. The children you will bring into this world will be even greater warriors than I, luckily for you. There are five daughters of our district barons, who don't know that you exist yet. We will pay them a visit if you so choose. Wait, I thought you mentioned seven districts. Did the other barons not have daughters? Her face saddened. No. They did, but, one was confirmed murdered, and the other confirmed lost during the battle. I'm sorry about your loss. Like I mentioned, Lucian, taking these women as your mates is of your choice and yours alone. Any other women you impregnate outside of nobility will not be allowed to court or wed you, as per rule. And as for the untouchables, they are just that. Untouchables. You may not socialize with them. After all, we don't want the god's lineage tainted with low wielders of the light. But, we are thinking too far ahead of ourselves. 
We will begin with our mission of protection, starting with this pendant, she said, walking up to me. Kai swept her fingers over my chest, carrying the gem in her hand. A clear contrast from the last time someone handed my father's gift to me. Immediately, I could tell that Kai was genuinely concerned about this demigod, while Nicole had given me predator vibes. The light's core has a special property we need to unlock, available to kins of the eternal light. But you need light to use it. It is possible that Shadow Elp you dated knew that it could spot shadows posing as humans. Eh, you say that like I would have fucked her knowing she was this monstrous alien from another galaxy. Don't take offense, Lucian. She only used your desires against you. Heh. <laughs> oh thanks, Kai, that made me feel a lot less pathetic. Shadow Elps take on various forms, and sometimes use our insecurities, desires, or fears to morph themselves into the things we hate or like most, luring us to our deaths. The more skilled Alps can possess human vessels, where they can either keep the vessel's appearance or morph it to their liking. It's a very dangerous feat against Ligerians, and for Earthlings. But, this pendant's ability to spot the enemy could have helped our people. Though, Kieran would have had to stay in Ligera in order to use it. Which is a good thing he gave it to you before he left. What's strange is that a Shadow Alp on Earth knew to take it from you. Not as strange as one being on Earth to begin with. The light's core innately protects its wearer from fatalities without needing the power of light just as long as the user is a Ligerian god and has it on. It is why Kieran told you to keep it on at all times. If that shadow elp hadn't snatched it from you, you wouldn't have needed my healing. Whereas this property of spotting shadow elps in disguise requires light. Which is precisely why we need to visit the spirit mother Shinra, or mother of Legera, in the Zemia temple, to figure out how to awaken your light, seeing as you are part human, and not full god. Are we even sure it will work for me? She paused, giving me a worrisome look. No, but I am hoping. You are still part god. Shinra would know more about it. She is the mother of our planet, like Kirin is the father-son of Legera. The two are close. Unlike Kirin, Shinra remains in spirit, where we can still talk to her. You still haven't answered one thing though, I said, narrowing my eyes on her. And what is that? What the hell do these shadow elves have to gain by killing humans? I voiced strongly, my mother's death suddenly flashing before me. And if it wasn't for Kai, I would have been one of their victims as well. They are the embodiment of anti-life, she explained. They live to destroy and spread darkness. It's why defeating the void is very important not only to our world, but to yours as well. Next scene. Kai had dropped a lot on me. More than I bargained for. After she spun that whole save and impregnate the world bit, I felt mentally drained. Though, I had enough strength in me to go for an extended walk, one that wouldn't cost me my life this time. She took me on a tour around the palace, which gave me Victorian dystopian vibes. I could tell a struggle had happened here, and that they were still recovering from the attack from two years ago. I also noticed a scarce number of people working and living in the estate, most of them were women and children. I almost asked her what had happened to all of the men, before thoughts of battle stopped me from asking her such a stupid question. For the most part, the West Wing was destroyed, with the exostructure looking like it had done its time buried in flames. Rooms had no ceilings, some parts missing a solid foundation and frame. There was a cold hollow feeling coming from the corridor that swept through me, even though the climate resembled that of springtime. It was depressing to say the least, and as Kai and I walked, she continued to weave the tale of the attack that had taken down her civilization. After the two-hour-long tour and backstory, I couldn't see myself leaving Legera. By the sound of it, not only was their social structure different, but their people were too. She told me that certain areas would shock me with people looking less human, and more. Demi-human? The features varied, but she told me not to be frightened if I caught someone walking around with cat ears, fluffy tails, and other inhuman parts. To be honest, I was both excited and confused. That wasn't to say I wouldn't miss my life back on Earth, but my father's people needed a hero. Shit, that may have been presumptuous of me to think that I could mend this broken world, but I had to try. I not only owed it to Kai for saving me, but to my father as well. The type of person my dad was sure as hell rubbed off on me. Kieran was unselfish, always ready to put others in front of himself. He was caught hiding out in charities, doing community work for earthlings, even though he wasn't one. My father was humble and hardworking, ready to give and give some more. My mother had admired that about him, and what she'd called, quote-unquote, his devilish good looks. I found myself still tailing Kai around the palace, but this time, it looked like we had a destination down at the East Wing, where everything seemed untouched by chaos. 
I could appreciate the heavenly aesthetics and luxury of the place here, the aura already putting me in brighter moods. She took me to a hallway upstairs, past five doors, and stopped at the sixth one. You will be staying here tonight, she said, pushing down the lever, welcoming me to a room suitable for a king. Are you sure this is where I will be staying? I asked, my eyes still roaming while I stepped inside. I was visibly marveled by the marble on stone, the crisp white tones, and the tall towering pane of windows. I even had my own balcony, adding a bit of flair to the entire regal package. This bedroom was your father's. Kai said, making my head pivot behind me. My father's? I pondered, turning my person to her. That shocked expression on my face vanished, looking back at Kai now impressed. Heh, I guess I have to appreciate it all I can before we head out, huh? Our kitchen is still undergoing repairs, but my friends and I are having a campfire in a little while if you'd like to join us. Is that a dinner invitation? It is. Then count me in. Chapter 7 Kai definitely made me feel comfortable in my father's home. I was given towels, a night robe, some soap, you know, basic bath materials. And after I washed up and got dressed in the plain clothes she'd laid out for me, I followed the directions my host gave me to meet her and her friends out in the courtyard. It was now seven at night, according to the wall clock in my bedroom before I left. Strange thing was that when it was night out, it was stupid dark, barely any moonlight type of dark. When I stepped out from the back, I noticed a row of lights hanging off wooden chutes, something similar to bamboo garden lighting on earth. Except these were extra luminous, lined up all around the perimeter for shadow spotting reasons. Hey, Lucian. Over here. This perky voice called out to me, and I stuck my head out past the corner of the courtyard, noticing the campfire and three people around it. How the hell did she spot me? There was Kai, mystery girl, and mystery guy, her friends. I waved back at the girl with a warm smile, then started to approach them. The closer I got, the more visible their features became, were all Nigerian girls drop-dead gorgeous? She had an unorthodox hair color also, a light shade of blue and sapphire eyes, while the guy next to her looked more like me, minus the pointed ears. Talk about a curveball. I picked up the short elf ears before I noticed the huge scar on his face, over his right eye that looked milky white. I figured he was blinded in that eye from the battle, but it didn't make me look at him any different. I'm glad you decided to join us. Kai's friend greeted. Glad to be invited. Kai had told us so much about you. Please, sit, sit. I did, on the same log Kai was sitting on to her right, in between her and her friendly lady friend. My name is Mira. The blue-haired girl extended her hand, and I took her offer, her handshake surprisingly strong. And this is my boyfriend, Jet. Jet shot me a short salute, my friendly wave over my head mirroring his. Wow, you look just like our god, Kirin. Heh, <sighs> really? Well, I do get that a lot back home, I replied, taking the compliment, in her hand that still had mine shaking it. Geez Mira, you don't have to flirt with the guy right in front of me. Jet teased. She giggled nervously, peeling off of me embarrassed. I wasn't flirting with him, just making a fair observation. Nah, she was flirting with me. She had a subtle blush on her round face, and even after Jet caught her, she turned back to me with those big friendly sapphire blue eyes. Oh, where are my manners? She turned to the roast in the pot, grabbed the ladle and a white bowl, and served me. I made it myself. I'm the palace's chef. Learned how to cook all types of stuff after the big battle. Mostly Rado's cultural dishes. Might as well pick up a hobby while defending the turf, am I right? She smiled. Please, try it. Ah, thanks. I said, taking her offer. It smells amazing. She gave me a huge steel spoon too. Inside, it looked like soup with a bunch of meats inside of it. The liquid was red, which gave off spicy vibes, but the smell was sweet. On the side, she set this dough ball in another dish, I'm assuming to go along with the soup? I tried the meat first, scooping it in my spoon and bringing the steamy chunk to my lips. After two modest blows, I bit in, the meat practically melting off the stubby bone, sending all types of flavors in my mouth. Mmm, -hmm, tastes just like chicken. You mean, you like it? Kai asked. Yeah, I chewed. What is it? It's Moo Moo, Mira said proudly. I turned to Kai for an explanation, and she came back with something that stopped me mid-chew. It's an equivalent to rodents on Earth. I dropped my spoon back in the bowl before she could even finish her sentence, my eyes growing wide from disgust. 
but I didn't want to seem insensitive to their food, even though I'd just eaten rat. Kai noticed my face churning and passed me her drink, something seemingly safe like water. Here. I took her offer, the bubbles from her glass pricking my nose. I guzzled it down in two seconds, then sighed in relief. Wasn't strong enough to wash that taste of fake chicken off my tongue, but it'd have to do. Oh, I'm sorry. Mira gasped. I turned to that sheepish expression on her face, forgetting my manners. Ugh, I didn't mean to do that. Really, it was great, just. Roasted rat wasn't something I ate back in New York, heh. I was embarrassed for her, but she took my words well. That's fine. Maybe you should tell me what you're used to eating back home. That way I can make some of your favorite dishes. Jet gave an exasperated sigh. Heh, that sounds great, but I don't think Kai and I will be sticking around long enough for me to enjoy your delicious food. Oh. Mira turned to Kai. I was under the impression that Kai brought you here to help us defend your father's home. That's a selfish way of thinking about it, don't you think, Mira? Jet said slipping the ladle back into the pot after he had poured himself another serving of rat soup. The demigod needs to spread his wings and serve all of Legera. Isn't that right, Lucian? Well, it sounded a bit patronizing coming out of his mouth like that, but, yeah, I replied. In Legera, it's different. A lot different than what your pampered lifestyle had gotten you used to. Here, food is scarce, so you take what you can find, and you make a meal out of it. When you're traveling out there, you have to take what you can get, and make the best with what you have. The sooner you learn to accept that, the better. Oh, but don't worry, Lucian. You will be traveling with one of our greatest warriors of Rado, Kahaya. Mira beamed. She will take good care of you. I cleared my throat, turning away from Kai, who was getting all flustered up from Myra's comment. Just think of it, the two of you, questing together, fighting together, eating and sleeping. Aya, I think he gets the point. Jet interjected Mira. Kai will show you the ropes, I'm sure. We will be okay over here. Even though we would be losing Kai. It's for the greater good. In the long run, it will pay off. Do the Shadow Alps hit the capital that often? I questioned. At night they do. That's when they love to hunt. Mira said, a bit too cheerfully. I looked around, to my left and right, feeling like we were all sitting ducks out here. They tend to hunt in waves, or packs. Then shouldn't we head back inside where it's lighter and, ugh, safer? It's okay, Lucian. We can see them coming with all of the light around us. How is she saying this like being bait was a normal thing? What confidence? Also, our weapons are sitting behind you, Mira continued. If they attack, we will be ready to fight. Getting a weapon should be the first thing on your to-do list, Lucian. Jet followed. Maybe Kai had already explained it to you, maybe not but I'll say it again to stress its importance. Besides your father, no one's light can fight Shadow Elps directly. Whatever light powers we can manipulate, the Shadow Elps can cancel it out by outputting the same amount of shadow energy. Reason being is that they are all connected to the same source of power, the void, making their repertoire shareable. It's called shadow pooling. As for us, we are limited on light, evenings being the worst times to fight, seeing as we can only absorb the sun's energy during the daytime. The best way to neutralize a shadow elp is through enchanted weaponry. Of course, the shadow elps eventually caught on, and our special mystic blacksmiths have been killed for it, except for a select few still living in hiding. Through their mystic weaponry, we can expand and extend our powers, infuse our light to cause more damage, and amplify our output to disrupt these shadow freaks before they even know what's coming at them. How do these special blacksmiths enhance weapons like that, making them compatible with light energy? He grinned. A good mystic blacksmith never reveals his secrets. And it's a good thing too. You don't want that kind of knowledge falling into the wrong hands. Jet, while it's vital for Lucian to get a weapon, Kai told us he hadn't unlocked his powers yet. Am I right, Lucian? Mira asked. Yeah, I said, almost embarrassingly. I don't even know what it looks like. Mira giggled. You mean, Kai hadn't shown you a light show? No. Wait a minute. Jet piggybacked. You mean to tell me the sun god sun is powerless? Not powerless, just untapped. Mira said, quick to defend me. But I wasn't sure about all of that. Jet was onto something here. I knew he only mentioned it so I could look less heroic to his interested girlfriend, but he was right. 
I was powerless. If I had the power of light, it'd be something that would've shown up by now, right? Let me see your stats. Mira asked me like I had a clue. I furrowed my eyebrows, that look on my face speaking words for me. You know, your stats? We haven't gotten to that point, yet. Kai said. Oh, great. That means I can teach you. Mira beamed, clasping her hands together. Lucian, everyone, even Shadow Alps, have visible stats associated with them. It follows you around, and is essentially part of you. Its purpose is to help us identify classes as well as to easily simulate leveling up for light wielding. Kai mentioned having healed you already. By default, the stats panel opens up for a few seconds before and after any healing processes. To trigger it yourself, just think, trigger self-stats. To make the menu go away, simply think, terminate self-stats. The same applies for viewing other stats as well. For example, if you want to see mine, just think, trigger stats, but you have to be focusing on me, though. When you're done, just terminate it. But note, if you're reading my stats, I will know, because I will get the small flickering little light on the bottom of my faded menu until you're done reading me. Or after about 30 seconds. I'm sorry, what? Was she really telling me that those screens I'd seen before were an actual thing? There's no way. Come on, try it. Damn it, well. Here goes nothing. I looked at Mira head on, and said, trigger stats, inwardly. Holy crap. I nearly tipped over on my seat, that same screen reappearing again. Only this time, these weren't my stats, but Myra's. Triggered stats. Name, Mira Gotheri. Race, Ligerian. Class, Wealth Producer. Role, Common Chef. Level, 39 Experience, 5,443 39,000. Points to be allocated, 0. Agility, 19. Brawn, 36. Charisma, 27. Core Range, 97. Health, 3,500 3,900. Light Energy, 60%. Innate light specialty, none. Weapon, Darka Dual Elbow Blades. Weapon EXP, 46100. Weapons Durability, 43100. Skills. Light classes learned, none. Light enabled abilities, hidden. Weapon infuse, tethers weapon to user's light energy, thus empowering it. Slowly draws energy with use. Items. None. Pretty cool, huh? She cheered. When allocating points, it works the same way. For example, if you want to add points to brawn, just think, brawn, plus four, or minus four. But you better be sure, because once that menu goes away, you cannot change your mind. It's set in stone. Another thing to remember is you also cannot hide your stats. If someone opens it, they can close it or it terminates automatically after about 30 seconds. How about we see yours, Prince? Jet said condescendingly, putting the spotlight on me. Heh, trust me, you don't want to see a blank page of stats. Jet here is just messing with you, Lucian. You have light, it just needs to be awakened. Here, let me show you. Mira offered, taking my wrist and lining her pointer finger at the ball of my palm. It is something that comes naturally. She whispered, her voice turning flirty on me. Poor Jet had to just sit and watch his girl continue to hit on me, what a sport. Maybe you just need to feel it, and wiggle it out from hiding. She showed me what she meant, applying small pressure with that finger, before striking it along my skin, like a matchstick. And on the ball of her finger, this circle of bright yellow light, almost blinding. Ah, uh, see? You do have powers. What? Kai said, dropping her bowl and shimmying closer to Mira and I. See, yes? I took this from Lucian. This isn't my own light. Is that all you got from him? Jet asked, noticing how tiny that ball on her fingertip was. Yes. Lucian has light, but right now, the output is minimal. Just like a newborn's. Jet scoffed, Mira snipping him a quick glare. Don't insult the Prince of Legera, Jet. Give him credit, he is part human. I am sure with time, he will obtain all the power he needs to save our world. How very optimistic of you, Mira. I said, giving her a humble smile. But I'm still finding it hard to believe you got that from me. As soon as I said that, the ball flickered and vanished. I didn't feel anything when you summoned it. Very soon, you will be able to do this. 
Mira demonstrated, spinning a huge ball of light out of her hand, like spinning yarn. It was impressive, and amazing. Quite the light show. The power of the sun, the purest photogenic energy. We use this to fight shadow elves in all of their forms with our weapons. Jet added. In this palace alone, I had to wield my own against one of them who shape-shifted into Mira. The monster hijacked a body and warped its look to fool me. I allowed it to get too close, and it attacked. I paid a hefty price for it, but I'm thankful to be alive. I assumed he was talking about that huge slash over his eye. I sympathized with him, having had a run-in with a shape-shifting shadow elf myself. They can morph into anyone, Lucian. Mira continued. You need to be prepared and keep your guard up at all times. It is. A stressful lifestyle, to say the least. What else can they do? I asked. They can use the power of the primordial void to do many things. Besides possessing humans, they can possess animals also. And in place of light powers, they can send shadow emissions, projectiles and blasts. Not to mention in their shadow state, they can camouflage, induce blindness, and some other not-so-friendly things I've been told were possible, but thankfully never witnessed myself. Even the more elite ones can regenerate and shadow manipulate. Shadow manipulate? What's that? Manipulating shadows. Kai finally spoke. They can manipulate the casting of your shadow to control you. My stomach dropped. But don't worry, you'll train to beat even the strongest shadow elf. Myra's optimism was something else, wasn't it? Or maybe I was just pampered, coming from a place where I didn't have to worry about huge shadow monsters coming out to get me. Little did I know, it was happening in secret, with a massive wave of homicides, and then more recently, my ass nearly being eaten alive by this spicy little ginger that turned blood happy. I have to ask, I said, interrupting my own train of thought, if I am expected to have limitless light like my father, then why do I need a weapon? It is best that you wield your light with an extender regardless of your eternal light. You are still half-human. Mira followed. Also, you may be limitless, but that luxury in its current state is untamed. Having an extender allows you control over your powers, where gaining experience and leveling up core range will ultimately allow you to use your limitless light to its full potential. But you have to unlock your light first. Core range? The light capacity your body can take without. Overheating. Jet clarified. Oh shit, I'm gonna burn like a big ball of fire and give Legera a second sun. Lucian. Kai called out, probably noticing that I was getting shaken up by all of this information. She scooted closer to me, giving me her undivided attention. I understand that all of this is challenging for you to comprehend. I also understand that we as a planet are asking too much from a commoner of Earth. I refuse to force you to embark on this journey with me. It is your choice, and your choice alone, regardless of what we expect from you. So, I can offer you freedom right now, and will bring you back to your world. Just know I won't be able to stay with you and protect you from the darkness hunting you in place of our light god. My mission of protecting my people comes first, hence, why I was searching for your father on earth to begin with. And what is my second option? I said, almost afraid I had asked. Or we can make a contract. A contract? If you stay, train to harness your light, master the art of weapon wielding, and learn to become the demigod you are, then I will bring you back home. Where you could continue being just a commoner. Well, that was an enticing way of saying it. But. Only after you help Legera reduce the Shadow Elk population to a reasonable level, while increasing our population. She had her right hand over her chest, Kai taking this contract seriously. And so should I. I gave myself a minute to think about it, the unsettling silence slicing the tense air in two. It was a contract, a legit agreement I couldn't break once I entered it. And as everyone stared at me waiting for my answer, I had to reflect on what would happen in both worlds if I declined her offer and sent my ass back home. Shit, either way, I was screwed, wasn't I? Chapter 8 Kai sure was persuasive. I had accepted the conditions of the contract, everyone around the campfire super excited that I did. Except for me. I felt blindsided, like I seriously just walked into the lion's den with zero idea of what was to come. My only interaction with a shadow elf seemed minimal compared to what they were capable of. I had no clue about what awaited me, but Kai and Mira, they seemed confident in my potential. I had to think that maybe. There was some fire in me yet. I gave a long tiring sigh, thinking about a few hours ago with Nicole. The light's core, my father had told me to never take it off. Now, I understood why. Kai had mentioned it would have saved me from a fatality. But, 
I guess it was a good thing that I had it off. If I'd survived that attack, I probably would have just hightailed it to the nearest police station, where they wouldn't believe a word of it. My life and my grandmother's would be in constant danger, looking over our shoulders for Nicole. No, I needed this to happen. I needed Kai to find me. I felt like I had a new purpose, besides the one my fellow Ligerians gave me. I wanted justice for my mother, understanding that these shadow Alps were behind her murder. The timeline matched up perfectly. Two years ago, a huge attack here broke out. Two years ago, my mother was killed. Two years ago, my father gave me the light's core and disappeared. I wouldn't let this one slide. I was still hot from Nicole tricking me like that, but my mom was a different story. She was a kind-hearted soul, and she didn't deserve that brutality. I swear I would avenge her, for me, for dad. And getting to the spirit mother Shinra, or, mother of Lajira, in the Zemia temple, was our first destination. From what it sounded like, she was quite a distance away, so Kaya told me to rest up for our journey at the crack of dawn. Her weapon of choice, a bow, an arrow. As for me, I was just dead weight, someone she had to protect until I triggered my own light powers. But before we did any of that, Kaya had promised me she would talk to her mystic blacksmith, in an undisclosed location that even I wasn't allowed to know. Hey, no offense taken. I was still a stranger in her home, so I didn't mind not following her last night to explain the customization of my weapon, a blunt sword crossed with a machine gun. I got creative. I needed a long-range weapon, with close-range defense, kinda like soul bad guys, without the excess weight to it. I sat in my bed crossing my fingers that she remembered the specs correctly, and I had been a little shocked that she hadn't questioned my bizarre choices. Hmm, maybe this special blacksmith could really whip up something like that for the Son of the Light God. I'd feel extra special if he did. I started thinking about these stats I needed to bulk up in the process. Figuring it was a better time than any to get used to this strange phenomenon of a magic panel and start paying attention to it this time. So I opened it with a trigger self stats. Triggered self stats. Name, Lucian Reef. Race, Human Ligerian. Class, Kieran's Air. Role, N.A. Level, 1 Experience, 655 1000. Points to be allocated, 0. Agility, 4. Brawn, 5. Charisma, 48. Core Range, Searching. Health, 100 100. Light Energy, Searching. Innate Light Specialty, None. Skills. Light Classes Learned, None. Items. Light's Core. Damn, my charisma was high. I guess that made sense. Heh, yeah, regardless, these numbers were pretty depressing. I had a long way to go, my journey just beginning. With the yawn, I forced myself under the covers, with a crazy day ahead of me. It was about midnight, and in a couple hours, I was scheduled to head out to find out if these mortal bones had any godly powers to them. And if they did, I could push myself to learn as much as I could about the light, and maybe then I could take it a step further than destroying Shadow Alps by finding the void itself. Next scene. The sun woke me up, my personalized alarm clock. Granted, I had forgotten to set one, cracking my eyes open, realizing there wasn't even any in sight. I sat up, rubbing the sleep off my face, and the drool off the corner of my lip before looking over to the nightstand, where there was a note sitting on top of it. I reached over and broke the red seal, my vision still blurry, but I caught the clean cursive and the faint smell of roses bouncing off parliamentary paper. Fancy. What the hell? I groaned, still groggy, where I noticed the signature at the tail end, your friend, Mira. Shit, she was writing me love letters now. I felt my back tensing up, the note knocking the sleep right out of me. I sat along the edge of the bed, flipping the top half of the note open and started reading. Dearest Lucian. Words cannot express my gratitude. Your alliance with us means everything, and I do hope that you succeed in your journey with not only finding an answer for our people but finding answers within yourself. I know all of this can be very confusing, but don't fret, Kai is there with you. Be patient with her, she can be strict and forceful at times, but that's because she takes her job very seriously. Get her to open up, and she can be a real pleasure to be with. If it isn't obvious, Kai is more on the recluse and private side, but I can tell that she already likes you. I had made it my personal mission to stay on top of Ogre, our blacksmith, so that you can have the pleasure of traveling with your very own weapon. I know you cannot wield the light just yet, but being with your extender can give you the confidence you'll need out there. I left it standing against the wall by your footboard. It's all wrapped up for you and ready to go. 
I pray that you come back to us safely, Lucian. All the best. Oh, sweet. It wasn't a love letter. Nah, I was playing, I got my custom weapon. That was crazy fast. That light magic doing wonders. I sprung off the mattress like a kid on Christmas morning, rushing to the foot of my bed to see my new present, wrapped up in brown mesh cloth and all. I couldn't have been more excited, untying the knotted ropes before ripping that bad boy open. Goddamn. It was beautiful, shimmering in my eyes with all its splendorous glory. They got the details right down to the T, adding a bit of accented flair to it. It was exotic, painted in a warm red finish, with black as its secondary color. The shape resembled that of a less exaggerated Kakuri dagger, where at the joint of the grip I got my relatively smaller machine gun, fully loaded. Oh hell, I could cry. It was gorgeous. But when I picked it up, I was gonna really cry, because that sucker weighed a fucking ton. Did she forget to tell the magical blacksmith to ease up on the metal? I was breaking my back, barely able to carry the thing let alone swing it over my shoulder. And when I did, my knees caved in. Ugh, this wasn't good. Now I was really going to slow Kai down. I dropped my sword on the ground, an exasperated breath rolling off my tongue. I turned to my right and noticed the strap that was to go over my shoulders leaning against the wall, squinting at that bastard hard. No way am I going to embarrass myself in front of Kai. A girl who had already saved my ass once, no less. I adjusted myself and my sword, fixing it over my shoulders with the biggest strain. My legs started to shake as I tried to straighten them out. And when I did, I announced my official name for this thing, BB, for backbreaker. I patted myself on the back for making it a few steps across my bedroom with it, taking a long hard look at the mirror with my weapon on. I had to admit, it didn't look bad on me. Just wished it didn't weigh a ton I needed to get adjusted with it on, pacing back and forth, finally noticing that if I kept my upper body strength tight and my chest out, I'd have a fighting chance with it on long term. Alright, enough with the heroic poses. I gotta get ready to head out. I gave my sword a break and took my shower things, heading for my private bath, only to notice that my water wasn't running. I scrunched my face, fidgeting with the faucet over and over again. Seriously, no water? Well, how about the shower, same conclusion. Shit, this blows. I was already in a towel, so I rushed out into the hallway, noticing a hall bath. In my rush I had forgotten my shower stuff, that complimentary sponge and soap, reaching to the end of the corridor with a sharp deadpan look on my face. It was a half bath, with only a sink and a toilet in it. Okay, I was getting impatient now, this sudden cool draft rising under my towel downsizing me. I paced myself, searching around until I reached this unoccupied bedroom. It was unlit, looking like no one had stepped inside it for years. My face lit up once I realized it had its own private bath too but that sparkle in my eye would fade once I noticed it wasn't as unoccupied as I had originally thought. My mind went dark, the picture of her dripping wet naked body locking the gears in my head. I must have looked like a creepy drunk too, standing there with my jaw on the floor, gawking at her as Kai dried her hair with a towel on her head, the only towel she had on her. I tried with everything in me to keep the excitement off my face. But it was so hard to peel my marveled eyes away from her. I didn't think it clicked for her yet, that the son of a light god had just walked in on her stepping out of a steamy shower. Why hadn't she freaked out yet? And better question, why hadn't she covered herself? Why the fuck was I asking myself these stupid questions? She looked absolutely delicious, from head to toe. Silky soft creamy skin. Mouth-watering curves. With supple breasts big enough to fit inside my mouth. My towel started to ten up. Finally, she broke out into a flush, appearing to be sheepish, but all she did was slip her mouth open as if she were going to say something to me. And then, she looked away, dropping her towel over her chest, but not enough to hide her tempting body from me. My guardian angel, she wanted something, reading her body language before she asked me. Am I? To expect that I am your first, Lucian? My eyes grew wide. What? Are you here to breed me? I must have blinked over a thousand times. That comet caught me off guard. Did she really think I hunted her down to fuck her this morning? Would I? Could I? Wait, what was I saying? I couldn't have sex with Kai. She was my escort for Christ's sake. We were a duo, a friendly duo. Our relationship had to be platonic because, if I slept with her, how awkward would that be? According to her, it was against the sun spirit's wishes to court her. She wasn't part of the Baron's manor. She wasn't royalty, so to speak. 
How crazy would it be to impregnate a dame, a warrior, and leave her out of commission after nine months? But, I could never just stand there naked and reject her. I mean, hell, how stupid would I be to reject someone like Kai? Strong, sexy, smart. I wanted the full package. Shit, I wanted her so badly right now that it was actually making me crazy. I couldn't think straight, let alone think logically. Come on, Lucian, make a move. Fuck her, or leave her. Kai, I breathed, disappointed in myself already. Um, I'm sorry for staring. But wow. Erm. Um. Heh, the funny thing is, my shower. It wasn't working. Well, I was out of water period. That's why I went looking around the palace for a spare bathroom, you know? Oh. She said, her disappointment matching mine. Crap, I felt terrible. I'm sorry I ever asked. Again, monotone, although this time her voice sliced me like a bunch of knives. She took her first step of shame, but it wasn't away from me. No, instead of dodging me completely, she approached me, every step she took making my face even redder. I gulped that hard knot in my throat, unsure of how she was going to respond to me. And when our bodies couldn't get any closer, she looked up my height, where I got a good look at her busty assets. That grip I had on that towel around my waist was gonna slip off for sure. She leaned into me, Kai's bare nipples brushing along my chest while she reached her hand up. It gave me a rise I wasn't ready for, sending impulses through my body. Was she bent on having her back blown out from me regardless? Hell, I couldn't lie, a girl who went after what she wanted was a big turn on. I was lost on those starry violet eyes, and that round gorgeous face of hers. Until, she did something I didn't expect. She took her thumb to my upper lip and brushed it over once, the gesture leaving me confused. When she pulled back, I noticed the red along her skin. Your nose is bleeding, Lucian. I jumped. Well, that was embarrassing. That also had never happened to me before. When she peeled her hand back, I tossed mine over my mouth and shied away from her. Ah, uh, heh, thanks. I'll get right to it. I rushed my shameful ass to the shower, a cold shower, so I could mull over the crime I'd just committed to not only myself, but to all of Legera. Chapter 9 I couldn't get Kai's slick naked body out of my head. That wasn't the image of her I needed right now as we prepared to head off to our little adventure into the dystopian remains of Legera. After I had taken my shower, I got dressed with the tasteful hand-selected wardrobe that was left in my closet. I didn't know why, seeing as I wasn't planning on coming back here anytime soon. But I guess the residents of this palace insisted I wore something more their speed. I left my western fashion sense behind me, walking into a plethora of fine fabrics, shoes, armwear, headgear, you name it. But in the middle of my walk-in, I had something special laid out for me on the bench to wear. Ah. I felt like a dress-me-up Ken doll. I could get used to being pampered like this when all was said and done. For now, I would enjoy my attire for the trip, polished armor with crop torso plates, matching padded leather gauntlets, a pair of dark Loxley pants and knee-high plated boots. Underneath the vest, I was given some type of tough-shelled piece to cover my torso. I couldn't tell what material it was made out of, but it was supple enough to slip onto me like a glove. The entire ensemble was dark for a planet named After Light. I had to wonder, was that so we could blend in with the shadows? I got dressed, admiring the sleek design. It didn't make me look bulky at all. And once I stuffed my small backpack with only the essentials, I made my way downstairs with my heavy-ass sword to meet up with Kai. Easy there, take it one step at a time. Wouldn't want to embarrass yourself in front of your crush. Lucian. The blue-haired girl chimed, greeting me with a peachy smile as soon as I noticed the trio in the foyer. I was halfway down the steps when I caught Kai, Jet, and Mira in front of the grand doors. Good morning, Prince. She greeted, holding something in her hands. It was a tray, with a plastic see-through bag on it. And inside, snacks. I hope that you slept well. I see that you got my letter, and your weapon. Looks great on you. I hope it's not too heavy. Not at all. I lied through my big white smile. Good morning Mira, Jet. Morning, Prince. Jet saluted. And... Kai, I breathed, trying not to make my nervousness nearer awkward or obvious. Morning, Lucian. She said, her voice less monotone than before, more... Flowery. I have something for you. Oh, I do too. Mira interjected, stepping in between me and Kai. Here. I made these for you. 
The shelf life on these are really long, so you can eat them whenever you run out of rations or something. Though, I would hope it would never come to that, of course. She giggled. Please, take them. They are fruit-based, crunchy on the outside, soft on the inside. They are packed with vitamins and minerals, less like trail mix and more like an energy bar. We call them Chuchan here in Rado. That's very thoughtful of you, Mira. Thanks. I took her offer, giving it a nice whiff through the back. Mmm, -hmm, and they smell great. Really? I made them this morning. And I promise, no rodent parts this time. I caught Jet rolling his eyes as his girlfriend drooled all over me. I appreciate it, Mira. Honest. I can't wait to dig into these. I have something for you too, Lucian. Kai said, handing over to me the long piece of fabric dangling over her arm. It's a hooded rope. A matching hooded rope? I beamed, taking her gift up to my eyes. As a matter of fact, we are color-coordinated. You look good with clothes on. I, arm, I mean, those clothes on. Heh. She smiled at me in my terrible fumble. Thank you. You look great yourself. She looked like a dark forest archer, the both of us dressed and geared to fight. It was exciting to say the least. And after we collected our food, supplies, and currency to head out, I tossed Myra's gift in my bag and gave the couple a parting wave. Come back to us safely, Prince. Next scene. Eh, I still couldn't get over them calling me that. I felt far from a prince. I was just doing what any caring person would do, right? Still, it felt nice to be seen in such high regard. I had to get used to it, especially if I was expected to take over for my father. It was a great day for an adventure, the air crisp, the climate clear, and our forecast looking promising. Because so far, I hadn't met one shadow elp. And I was hoping it would stay that way until I unlocked my light. As we walked further and further away from the palace, I started to wonder about our mode of getting from point A to point B. For some reason. I had forgotten to ask Kai about how we'd be getting around not only in Rado, but throughout all of Legera. She had mentioned Rado alone being massive, and the temple we were headed to was at least two districts down. But before I could even open my mouth and say anything, she pulled out this small ivory wooden flute and stopped her stride. I stopped right behind her on the grassy field, dumbfounded, ready to question why we had stopped walking literally after just a minute away from the palace. Then she started playing, a tune I was deaf to apparently. I couldn't hear a damn thing. And then suddenly, this huge shadow flew over my crown, prompting my head up to the clear blue sky. Holy crap! I cried, falling on my ass with my heart pounding. There was a huge beast of a creature flying about us. And for a second, I thought it was a shadow elk ready to take us out. But as the creature drew closer, I realized it was just a giant red panda. Yeah, a giant red panda. With angel wings, two striped tails, and long horns on its fluffy head. I scratched my eyes on that one. Honestly, I was taken away, the thing at least 12 meters wide, and 6 meters tall standing on its stubby black legs. My eyes grew on its way down, landing right in front of Kai as the gusty wind from its descension sliced right through me. That gentle quake when it landed begged me to get up on my feet, my arms shielding my eyes before it tucked its wings in. Good boy. Kai cooed, rubbing the creature's furry orange head when it bowed down before Kai. It purred, the beast so huge it was blocking the sun off my face. Kai turned to me with a smile, ready to introduce her friend to me. Lucian, this is Naro, my champion. Champion? Yes. Legera doesn't have many champions left, highly intelligent creatures that can serve as transportation or allies in battle. He is a Nukun, and may be the last Nukun on our planet. No other of his species has been seen in well over 200 years. Well, that answered my question. And, he seems friendly. That's because he is. She turned back to Naro, who was already strapped down with a long saddle on his back. Naro, this is Lucian. He is our god's son, and he is here to help us. Naro gave me a bright look, stomping over and around Kai to sniff me. Then immediately, the beast went whooshing. Round and round he went, circling me from sheer excitement. This Nakun acted more like a dog than anything else, wagging his tails with his tongue out, making a show for me. It had Kai giggling, and it was the first time since I'd met her did I see her break out in happiness like that. Heh, I like this flying beast already. It's nice to meet you too, Naro. I think it's safe to say he likes you. You think so? I chuckled. I'm still an alien to this planet, 
but I feel like there's a lot more of these huge creatures around here. Maybe not champions, but other beasts that would put some of Earth's largest sea animals to shame. Well, you would be right in that regard. While we don't have a panel for our creatures under our stats, we do have a general hierarchy for Shadow Alps. Bring up your stats and go to your general details panel. I cocked a brow up. I have a general details panel. She nodded. All you have to think is left and right to move through your panels. Okay, I'll give it a shot. I said eagerly. Trigger self stats. So I saw one panel, and Kai said all I had to do was think left and right. So let's try, right. Author note, the hierarchy of Shadow Alps is listed in the physical and electronic copy of The Light Prince of Legera by Troy Maverick. As well as in my Patreon. Please refer to those sources for details. End author note. Note, Shadow Alps can use the void to power shadow emissions, blasts, projectiles, etc. similar to how a Ligerian can wield light. A Shadow Elp with a full possession booster will have access to light powers. Note, there are two phases, Phantom Phase and Solid Phase. In the Phantom Phase, Shadow Elps cannot attack, but they can possess, go through walls, camouflage, and induce blindness. During their Solid Phase via possession, they are sacrificing their natural state to become susceptible, while allowing them the advantage to physically attack. I have to ask, why are these monsters branched out this way? When there is source pooling available? Not all Shadow Elps are seen as capable of executing commands properly. Even the void sets limitations to these sentient beings. Wait a minute, there's a column here that just says elite booster traits. Are those specialties that can be applied to any of these classes? Yes, but are still limited by their class in what they affect. These classes are there to orchestrate commands for the void after all. And this S class here, behemoth? Of various elemental and species types. Same goes for Wyrens. So these behemoths, if I understand it, aren't native to Legera. Whereas champions and wyrons are. They can be possessed by shadow elps? Correct. And when they do, they usually remain in the solid phase. But keep in mind, behemoths are known to be more violent and stronger than possessed creatures, making them the more dangerous S-class beasts. Holy hell. Don't let these classes scare you, Lucian. In time, you will learn to overpower them all. In the meantime, I am here with you for protection. I chuckled. Well, that's good to hear, Kai, I said, trying to hide that sheepish look on my face. I was the one who should be doing the protecting, ready to unlock my powers since yesterday. Terminate self-stats. Speaking of protecting me, you never showed me your stats, Kai, I mentioned, Kai suddenly standing stiff. What? She stuttered. Let's see what this general in my father's army got, I said, opening her panel with a trigger stats as I looked at her. No, wait. Triggered stats. Name, Kyle Ihart. Race, Ligerian. Class, Light Warrior. Role, General. Level, 104 Experience, 99,088 104 thousand. Points to be allocated, 0. Agility, 73. Brawn, 64. Charisma, 12. Core Range, 682. Health, 10,400 10,400. Light energy, 100%. Innate light specialty, healer. Weapon, bow and arrow. Weapon EXP, max. Weapons durability, 76100. Skills. Light classes learned, none. Light enabled abilities, hidden. Weapon infuse, tethers weapon to user's light energy, thus empowering it. Slowly draws energy with use. Ugh. My level isn't the best. She said bashfully. It's why I didn't want you looking at it. Was she serious? Kai, what are you talking about? You're at level 104. Not to mention, you're at max experience with your weapon. I could do better. I'm a light warrior, my stats should be higher. And if you consider how many years I've been a general, these numbers are a tad embarrassing. Heh, <laughs> they might not be impressive to you, but they are to me. I've slowed down on training when I went looking for your father. But basically, you gain points to allocate depending on your opponent. Though, beating a stronger opponent doesn't always translate to garnering more points to allocate when it's time to level up. You have to consider your opponent's stats as well. So what's the fastest way to level up? Experience. The more you battle, the faster you level up. Is there a max level? The last I heard, it was 200. 
she confirmed. But, you shouldn't worry about levels right now. Come, let's ascend. We will reach Rasani faster through air, she, she said, reaching into her bag that was five times as long as mine. Rasani? Is that the district where the Mother Spirit's temple is? No. Rasani is the next district over, the one closest to Rado capital, she clarified. Once we get to the border, we will have to dismount Naro. I don't want the wrong set of eyes on him. Heh, <sighs> I think all of Rasani would see him coming. Poachers are prominent in Rasani. Naro's species has pretty much died out because of selfish men and women using their bodies for profit. I'm sorry about that, Kai. I'm all for keeping Naro safe, I said, then scratched my head on our destination. Hey, if Rasani isn't the district where the temple is, then why are we stopping there? Because the Baron's home is there. And since it's on our way, it's fitting that we visit the Rasani Manor and meet the lady. My heart skipped a beat. The lady? As in, the woman I'm expected to sleep with? And mate, if you so wish. Suddenly, I didn't feel like going to Rasani anymore. Not to say I was nervous about getting it on with a complete stranger, but I was expected to impregnate her knowing that I wasn't going to be with her long term. Let alone help her raise our child. It was a different ballgame, one I still had trouble accepting. Spreading my seeds across the land. On some Farmer John type shit. I swallowed that lump in my throat as I watched Kai strap Naro down with the headpiece she pulled out from her back. I took a few short steps closer to her, Naro looking at me with his bright yellow eyes as he panted, like he was ready to happily pounce on me. So, this lady, what's her name? Kai listened to me speak as she worked the noseband over Naro, keeping her back toward me. Her name is Isla. Isla, huh? Lady Isla Matwaz of Rasani. That is how you will address her. Huh? What's with the formalities? Aren't I a step above her rank? Yes, but that is how she will be addressed. Kai urged. Oh, so she's a real brat, huh? I gauged, judging by that passive look on Kai's face. She can be a bit difficult, yes. Hard to please. Then, I'm in. Nothing like a challenging woman to spice things up. Chapter 10 The ride on Naro was a lot smoother than I had expected. I had the cool wind flowing through my hair, the breeze rolling down my face just right, in that view, Legera was mostly forest area and big bodies of water giving it that earthly vibe. If it wasn't for the fact that Legera hadn't just survived an attack, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between Rasani and the tasteful Victorian era. Except for that small section of land right at the border, which looked like the slums, or the Bronx. Kai told me about the kind of technological advancements they had in Legera. They were still tinkering around with it a bit, but with much trial and error, they had worked out a way to integrate their light into their infrastructure. I guess that luxury was just for the rich, because I couldn't see this part of town using anything remotely close to that. From what she also mentioned, they didn't have any cell phones, televisions, or PCs. Not to say that I'd need something to distract myself with, I already had a full-time job of not only saving the world, but also getting every woman in these barren homes knocked up. Dragonlord Placidusax was just gonna have to wait. As I rode behind Kai, we saw our target, Naro starting to descend a bit. The high altitude was something I had to get used to sooner rather than later, the oxygen in Legera already a bit thicker than that of Earth. My grip around Kai's waist as she led Naro down tightened, where I felt comfortable enough to lean my head over her shoulder. I wasn't afraid of heights, just didn't want my face stamped on Rasani dirt while we dropped. I could tell I was making Kai sweat, and it smelt like sweet vanilla off her smooth skin. Her body gently trembled the longer I breathed over her neck, and that grip she had on the reins locked in her rocking fists. I moved my cheek against hers, my fingers slipping over to her belly. Sorry if I'm making you uncomfortable, I confessed with a greedy grin that Kai couldn't see. No no. It's, um, fine, she said, her voice higher than usual. That's good to hear, because I don't want to slip off our ride. You can continue holding on to me, Lucia. Her gentle voice said, or begged, eh, couldn't tell which. Ah, she was starting to heat up. I had to admit, I was rather tempted myself but I promised I wouldn't put the both of us in that awkward situation. I could tell she liked me. And I had a thing for my guardian angel as well. But with this stupid rule set by the sun spirit, I couldn't have her as my girlfriend, just my sex partner, and that wasn't good enough for me. Once we reached the ground, Naro slammed his tails on the dirt, letting us know that we could dismount. I made my way down the rope, helping Kai down after. 
and once Kayam latched Naro, she gave him a sweet kiss on the side of his pointed snout and sent that bubbly fella on his way. We were at the border, where I quickly noticed the ground level view wasn't as great as the aerial one. It made the rest of Rasani look like a third world country, from the dry underdeveloped terrain, to the overcrowded shaggy looking houses. I took Kai's lead, making it down the street, where merchants were selling all types of rotten looking food. This didn't make any sense, why would the district heads allow a section of their land to run so poorly? The towns which are the furthest away from the Baron's Manor are our poorest, she said, making it more vulnerable to criminal activities. The Barons focus their manpower on the rich. Unfortunately, that is what we've resorted to after the attack two years ago. Did she have a superpower of reading my mind or something? We don't take the risk in trying to save these untouchable towns, because the likelihood of Shadow Alps hiding there are high. Hmm, that doesn't sound very fair for the innocent, does it? We rebuild from the center and disperse from there. Those are the rules. The Sun Spirit established these rules so we can strive, Lucian. We will tend to all of our people when that time comes, but for now, we must tread very carefully. On foot, we should be at the manor in a little over an hour. That's great. Plenty of time for us to get to know each other. I suggested, walking by her side with my hands in my pockets. What better way to pass the time, right? Eh, right. Well, she didn't seem as thrilled as I was about it. I remember Mira telling me that Kai was all business and no play, but she could let loose with me, and I wanted her to know that. We had a hard time blending in with the crowd with our gear on though, compared to the handouts everyone else was wearing. I took a good look around, absorbing the burning rubber smell, the hobos lining the street, and the black market we were about to approach on our right. It felt like everyone was staring at us as we passed, sizing us up and down like we didn't belong here. I was the alien on this planet, but this was the first time I had actually felt like an outsider. Perhaps we shouldn't. Kai finally suggested. I don't want to draw more attention to us. Heh, <sighs> I think these threads have beaten you to the punch. And like you said, those monsters naturally gravitate to me. Regardless, don't say things like that out in public. I don't want anything happening to you, Lucian. Please, stop. You're hurting me. A random call for help gravitated from my right, down at the black market we were steps away from entering. This territory had bad vibes all around, but when I heard that pitched voice call out, I just had to rush over to see what the hell was going on. I weaved through the crowd in a hurry, Kai following me, where I noticed her hand stretched out trying to stop me from addressing the issue. And the issue was that this lanky tart-faced prick was beating up on a girl. Take off that stupid hat. You fucking whore. The greasy-looking middle-aged man caught at her, grappling her down on the dirt ground with one hand, while the other held a whip against her. I've had enough of your lip. You do as I say, now. He growled. No one's going to want to buy a hard-headed bitch. If I need to beat some discipline into you, best believe I will. His tone was harsh, but the vibe he was putting off was harsher. There was bitter blood between what looked like slave and slave owner, my eyes catching about three other girls sitting in the bench behind them. They were just as fragile and meek looking as she was. I couldn't process how someone could be so cold hearted, the girls were clearly underdressed and undernourished. They were all covered in dirt and grime, blotches of fabric missing from their dingy oversized tunics. Around their wrists, cuffs, the chains all linked to each other, except for this one girl who was still on the other end of public abuse. A blonde-haired, ruby-eyed petite-looking thing, who looked like she was barely able to fend for herself. The scene boiled my blood, but what was worse was that no one was bothered by it. The girl cringed and hung her head below her chained arms, coiling at the whip that threatened to graze her flesh. Another strike, this one pulling the cords in my chest in two. She whimpered, that bloody lash against her back pushing my heated steps forward. Hey! I shouted, ready to stand in between the two. What the hell do you think you're doing? The man looked uglier up close, that crooked jaw of his slamming behind those dry blackened lips. And what the heck do you think you're doing? He snorted. Mind yours, runt. He shuffled to stand her on her feet, the girl practically shaking in his grip. Her face was beet red, with trails of tears on her cheeks. My chest sunk from just looking at how terrified she appeared, my eyes jerking back to the middle-aged slave keeper. Only a coward would beat up a defenseless person. And only a monster would harm a defenseless woman. What's it to you? They are barely people at all, huh? Mere objects and tools sold in exchange for tokens and goods. And they are my property. I get to do whatever I want with my property. If they have a soul, they also carry value. There's no value in these girls. I froze. 
No value? Are you selling these girls for a profit? He narrowed his eyes on me, that dirty grin on him repulsive. Why? Are you interested? I looked over to the girl, her eyes glued on me. I took a second to process that question over, while taking in her vulnerable state, her breath was jagged, her toes frozen, and her posture weak. And still, she kept those hands of hers along the long bunny ears of her green beanie, the same hat her slave master was trying to get her to take off. Those eyes. They were begging me for help. I looked over to the greasy bearded seller and asked him. What's the price? Five thousand inlows. Inlows? My head pivoted to Kai for answers, my traveling buddy taking two steps to me to reject my question. Lucian, this isn't a smart idea. Just one second. I said to the merchant, taking Kai's shoulder to the side. Kai, that man is just going to continue beating her down. I didn't see any marks of abuse on the other girls. But that one, I could tell, she's been through some shit. We have to help her. We are obligated to do no such thing. Kai countered. Lucian, those people are untouchables. The lowest of the low in class and rank. You should not associate yourself with their kind. Kai, how can you turn a blind eye to violence? I must consider priorities here, Lucian. While I don't condone his actions, we cannot get involved. Why don't we just buy her so we can let her free? Lucian. Come on, Kai. I'd expect a warrior of the light, a right-hand knight to my father, to help this girl out. It's what my dad would do. I left her speechless, because she knew I was right. And then after an unsettling stretch of silence, she finally admitted. Five thousand inlows. That's much too high for even a peasant. Well, how much do we got? Barely enough for our trip already. Don't worry. Karma will find a way back into our pocket. Karma? You know, karma. In our case, if you do something good, positive energy will come back and reward us. She scrunched her face at me, like I was forcing her to do something she didn't want to. Eventually, she broke, an exasperated sigh escaping her lips while she fished inside her pouch. She handed me over five coins, I assumed each coin was one thousand inlows. I gave her a beaming smile and thanked her, then walked back up to the merchant with his payment. Here, five thousand inlows, I offered, the man looking over my shoulders to Kai behind me with a curious frown. He slacked his jaw and gave me a scrutinizing look before he accepted the cash, followed by a low grunt. All right. He accepted, his dirty fingertips scraping the coins off my hand. You get to pick one. It's for yourself, right? I didn't know why that mattered, but I nodded. Yeah, she's my purchase. Good, cause I don't want you putting her up for an auction or anything like that. My girls are genuine, he said, continuing to contradict himself while he made his way to the three girls on the bench. A redhead, and two brunettes. Now, which one do you want? I froze. While they were all slaves, I only had enough cash for the blonde one. So I answered regretfully, I was talking about this one right here, with the hat. She looked at me shocked. Elry? He protested with a grin. You can't have Elry. She isn't for sale. I furrowed my eyes at him. Then why is she here with the others? Can't you tell? She is the most attractive. She will bring in customers to my booth when she's on display. He went over to her demonstrating those assets, flipping her around to show me her heart-shaped ass underneath that tunic barely long enough to cover her legs. You see that? She's got a lot of meat on her. And my customers love meat. The more, the better. It means she's ripe and fertile, her womb ready to be seated. While I shamefully enjoyed the showcase, the merchant swung her front back to me, her face hotter than before. She was embarrassed, those full pink lips of hers quaking over her trembling fists. Don't worry, my other girls are just as good. But my Elry is my prize. Glorabelle over there in the red can show you a good time, though. If I had enough money, I would buy all of them from you. Ha <laughs> ha. A real horn dog, aren't ya? You have a funny way of showing Elry that she's important to you. Whipping her to the point where she sheds flesh and blood. I want her, and her alone. His face went rigid on me quick. He seemed offended, but I wasn't messing around anymore. He knew I was after Elry, I had never mentioned any other girl but her. He was just being selfish, wanting to abuse her some more. All because of her refusal to take off her hat. Like I told you before, she is not for sale. Everything has a price, I started, giving him a more hostile tone. I got in his face, my frame towering over him. Just name one, or I'll pick. 
You trying to start something, shit face? He growled, and I felt Kai moving closer to me. The merchant dodged his eyes away from me for a second, his face gradually growing pale. His eyes were on Kai, and I had to suspect she reached over for her bow and arrow, ready to defend our position. More like ready to defend me, honestly. Kai was possessive, and serious about my protection since getting me to the mother's spirit in one piece was vital for Legera's survival. The grimy man dropped his shoulders with a grunt, taking a step back before he demanded. 10,000 inlows. What? I cried. You just said 5,000. That's the price for the regulars. Elry is special, so she gets a special price. Take it or leave it. I'm not backing down on that price. It's final. I turned to Kai, who had her hand over her head, ready to pull from her quiver. She awaited my instructions, that gaze I had on her telling her to cough up that extra change. I felt terrible for it, because she had already disagreed with saving this girl for 5,000. She bit her lip, trying to hold her tongue back before she fished for more cash. Here, I said, taking the money from Kai and offering it to him, again. Now, make with the keys and uncuff her. The greasy bearded man snickered, taking Kai's money again before stuffing it in his pocket. You must be some type of rich girl from Rado. I've never seen you before, he said, his words directed to Kai. Hell, since you have so much money, how about we up the price to 15,000? Seeing as you want her so badly. I glared at him, curling my hands into fists. Look, I'm not going to pry into whatever fantasies you two have planned for her, but I'd be stupid not to. I snatched the next words right out of his mouth, grabbing him by the collar with my fist cocked back. Hustling us wasn't part of the deal, shithead. We gave you your ten. Give us the girl. Now. He gave me a mean grill, his eyes starting to light up on me. Burning yellow, bright enough to blind me. I had almost forgotten that everyone here had the power of light. And here I was threatening a guy who could take me out with laser beams. I wouldn't. Kai threatened. Disengage now, or I won't hesitate to unleash an Armageddon on this entire illegal trade market. Ah, uh, did Kai just promise to blow up an entire town for me? I was flattered, and the guy was rattled, that look in Kai's eyes meaning business. I released him, the prick's glower on me the entire time. He worked slowly as he unbound Elry. But once those chains were off, she quickly stumbled over my feet. Come on, girls. He ordered, moving his booth elsewhere. Shit, that fucker left me with a bad taste in my mouth, but at least we managed to save one, the one who appeared to be getting more of the abuse from his trade. I bent down, helping Elry up as she wept, my eyes looking down at her chafed wrists. Hey, sorry you had to see that. I wasn't going to. Thank you. She cried, her voice cracked but high-pitched. And just when she was about to hug me, Kai intercepted. You're not allowed to touch him. Kai commanded, standing in between us. I, I, I just wanted to say thank you. She stuttered. You are welcome. But our job is done here. Kai turned to me. Lucian, we need to go, now. What? We can't just leave her here. She probably has no place to go. Lucian, she is an untouchable. And because she is in the exposed sections of the district, the possibility of her being a shadow elp is high. She doesn't look dangerous to me, I said gullibly, knowing firsthand how crafty those shifting shadow elps could get. Kai looked at me astonished, baffled by my ignorance. But this warrior of the light was serious, reaching in her pouch for the third time, eager to get rid of this slave girl. Here. Kai said, turning to the blonde slave girl, dangling a coin over her open begging hands. Take this and leave us alone. P please, can't I come join you? She begged desperately. No. You have some currency, now please go. Kai was upset, the angriest I'd seen her. Chapter 11 That was uncalled for, Kai, I scolded, walking past the booth where that blonde slave girl was still standing. I looked over my shoulder to see her staring at us as we left, like. She hadn't even moved a muscle at all. I felt terrible, Kai's harsh words against her cutting through me. I knew where she was coming from, and why she had to be extra careful, but if the girl was a shadow elp, then why would she have allowed herself to be beaten down and tortured like that? I get that I was a demigod, but my mentality was far from it. To me, there was no difference between Elry and me, but through Kai's eyes, untouchables weren't allowed anywhere near Kieran's air. Kai ignored my comment, the rest of our journey to the manor oddly quiet. I guess she figured I was upset with her about what she'd done back there, but I was just disappointed about it. I wanted to let her know that, but by the time I mustered enough courage to break through to her, we'd already reached our destination. 
In the front yard of the Baron's Manor sat this huge water fountain and a lush ring garden. The place was massive, something straight out of a fairy tale, except without the dense guards surveying the place. It was only a matter of time before we were made, but I noticed this brunette woman tending to her garden in a floral dress, with one long braided tail over her slender shoulder. She was tall, probably about 5 feet 10 inches, with blue eyes so bright, they looked like crystals under the sunlight. She pulled herself up from her bending over her garden, and stopped putting flowers in her woven basket. When her guards noticed us, they lined up to defend the lady, stopping us in our tracks. La Barazen. You are trespassing into the Baron's quarters. One armored guard warned us. State your business, light warrior. Wait, what? They knew who Kai was, so why were they being all defensive and hostile toward her? Ah, right, disguised shadow elves. We came to visit the Lady of Rasani. Password? Irati, Pagathi Rada. What in the what now? Kai gave a password, but the guards were still skeptical, hesitant to let us in between them. The tall woman in the sunflower dress poked her head out from behind her guards before pushing herself through the line, wearing the most beautiful smile I've seen in all of Legera. Oh, I have visitors? She said delightfully, her voice smooth like summer rays. Kai, what a pleasant surprise! She giggled, and then gazed over to me with interested eyes. She looked me up and down while I gave her a kind wave. This lady was nothing like Kai had described her, the woman practically radiating positive energy. She was friendly and seemed sweet, right until she grabbed my hand and leaned her chin over my shoulder, whispering. Are you the private entertainer I'd asked for? What? Lady Cecil, this is Lucian. My. Dasha. Kai stated bluntly, making the lady's eyes grow twice as huge. Okay, so it was safe to say this pretty little number wasn't who I was destined to bang. Bummer. Though, I wonder what a Dasha was. Oh my. How embarrassing. I am sorry, I wasn't aware. You know, these lonely nights can bring out the worst in you, am I right? She grinned bashfully. Please, guards, they are safe to enter. Kai gave you the password, did she not? Finally, we were allowed entry, the both of us following Lady Cecil inside. Come, I have these buttery croissants that I had my personal chef make for me an hour ago. We can talk, drink tea, and enjoy each other's company in the sunroom. So the food in Legero wasn't all exotic after all. Some dishes and recipes similar to what I'd have back home. I was crossing my fingers that these croissants didn't have any shredded mystery meat inside them, though. When we stepped inside the manor, I'd caught myself not being as taken aback by the decorative ambience of her estate, seeing as I'd come from Rado. And even though most of it was still in ruins, this manor's emperor-esque beauty didn't compare to my father's palace sitting in the capital. Once we were in the sunroom, her maid took her request to prep the table closest to those huge two-story windows. She gestured to us to come over just when Kai began to explain herself. I apologize, Lady Cecil, for calling Lucian my boyfriend. Choke. But I didn't want to reveal Lucian around untrusted company. Not to say that I don't trust your guards, but Lucian is far more special than that, she said, taking her seat while Lady Cecil propped her elbows on the table with her fingers interlaced under her chin. Enlighten me, warrior of light. Is he instead your husband-to-be? Oh. Ugh. No. Kai stumbled, her face turning a nice shade of red as she took her seat. He is our god Kieran's son, from Earth. He's what? A voice stretched out from the sunroom entrance before my ass could even hit the chair. All eyes turned to this pretty little redhead about the same height as Kai, standing there with her arms crossed over her chest, with a face that said piss off. Oh, so she was the brat. Guess that meant Lady Cecil was her beautiful mother. What a total contrast, except for their faces. She had her mother's beauty but not her charm, even though she was dressed elegantly from head to toe. Her hair swept behind her head in a braided bun, with two springy curls framing her delicate face. Her long dress screamed 18th century Victorian lace with black satin and vintage red embroidery. I prompted myself to stand straight as I was halfway through sitting down, walking up to her to introduce myself. Hey, the name's Lucian, I started, offering her my hand. And you must be Lady Isla Matwas of Rasani. Cecil's daughter. She gave me a sour look with that sass, leaving my hand hanging. Is that how you address the Baron's daughter? Ugh, yeah. Your name is Isla, isn't it? I understand you're from Earth, but I am sure they have manners where you come from, don't they? Sweetheart, this is Lucian, our Lord of Light. Her mother proudly exclaimed. Here to protect us from the void, just like I imagined it. 
She scoffed. Doesn't look like much of a god to me. Well, I might be currently lightless, but I'm Kieran's son all right. I mean, we're talking about the same guy, right, Kai? I asked, turning my head over to her. Wait a minute, you don't wield light? Isla asked me. I turned back to Isla. No, not yet. That's where Kai and I are headed, to the mother spirit, so she can unlock them for me. She grinned devilishly. Oh, mother, your prayers have been answered, all right. You must have been pleading to the void instead, seeing as you've been given this joke as a protector of Legera. She laughed and taunted. A powerless human, here to save us? This weak mortal isn't worthy of the air he breathes, posing as Kieran's son. You bring shame to our estate, coming here with nothing to provide but your shameless tactics. I narrowed my eyes on her with a witty grin. Is that so? Well, we might as well be in the same boat then. You see, I can't protect Lajera because I'm powerless, and you won't protect Lajera because you're too selfish to. Proof is in the conditions of your border, princess. Lucian, you will show the lady some respect. Kai scolded. Actually, I think it's the other way around, right? I grinned. Gods are above royalty from what I gathered from you, Kai. Actually, I'm pretty sure it's common knowledge. Which means, she ought to start talking to me right. But I don't want any animosity between us, Red. Let's start over. Name's Lucian Reef. And you are? I parried, leaving the room silent. But I was right. Little Miss Red had to show me some respect. I was her god, and even though she held the barren title under her parents, I was on top of that food chain, and I was bent on letting her know that, powerless or not. She schooled her face before the light demigod, but I could tell she was fuming inside. Isla had to swallow her pride this time, reserving her heat for a later date. And I'd be there for when she explodes, the lady now giving me her hand instead of a handshake. She expected a kiss, and I gave her one, being polite as I bent over, with my lips to the back of her hand. But when I was done, I didn't let her pull away. I gave her a playful glint, looking up my eyebrows at her while I held my hard grip on her fingers. She blushed and tugged, and I could feel her heartbeat racing. Did she think she was in trouble with me? Hell, I didn't know, but I enjoyed the reaction I was getting from her either way. And when she started to sweat, I'd let her go, watching the heat continue to rise up her stubborn cute face. Pervert. She cried, rubbing her hand at her chest. Ah, they are getting along just fine. Cecil beamed behind us, giving me the impression that she knew why we paid her and her daughter a visit. Please, stay the night. It will allow us to get better acquainted with the Light Prince, yes? Chapter 12 That Lady Isla was something else, but I knew she was into me. No, that wasn't my ego talking, it was the God-honest truth. I could tell with the way she had looked at me, turning an innocent gesture into something perverse. I was only trying to intimidate her, fooling around a bit, and she thought I was trying to flirt with her. Little did she know, she had been the one flirting with me. Her body language had said it all, but she was too snobbish to admit it. Instead, she had tossed insults against my name, refusing to believe I was who I said I was. We all knew better, the evidence all over my face. I was the spitting image of my father, minus the huge chest and the bulging biceps. After Kai and I had taken Cecil up on her offer, we finished our light snack without the red-headed brat, who insisted she'd rather eat fresh manure than dine with me. Talk about making the deadly attraction obvious. Then we were escorted to our separate rooms on the second floor, where luxury had no bounds. It was kind of Cecil to set us up as temporary guests in her lavish home, and even nicer of her to suggest we pick out dishes for dinner tonight. I wasn't particularly picky, just as long as there wasn't any rat on my plate. The moon sat nicely over the estate, the clock striking seven o'clock. I was settling in just fine, having already washed up and slipped into something more comfortable, a plain white button-up and some grey trousers. I even left my sword in my room when I stepped out, with the ammo and my other gear there as well. I was planning on showing Isla a flirtier side of me to break the ice, but then I noticed Kai's bedroom door slightly open, and I was strangely drawn to her instead. Hmm, I figured I should try getting to know my guardian angel first, right? After all, we hadn't really gotten the chance to hit it off, unless I called accidentally walking into her naked or having my guts spilling on her lap breaking the ice. I gave her door two sharp knocks, introducing myself, Hey Kai, it's me. You. She swung the door open, so hard that I thought she was gonna knock herself out with it. Be busy? Hey. Heh, that was fast. Lucian? Are you alright? 
Did you need me? Kai asked, concern written all over her face. And no, I'm fine. I was just wondering if... We can maybe talk? You want to talk with me? Yeah. In here? Um, yeah, sure. All right. She said, welcoming me in before she closed the door behind me. Hey, why did you get the bigger room? I playfully complained, my eyes scanning the room, right up to the dome-shaped ceiling. Just a coincidence, I'm sure. She said with a sweet smile. Hmm, she must have been happy to see me. I mean, we've only been separated from the hip for an hour. She took a seat along the edge of her bed, and when I joined her, she started to act a bit skittish, her eyes glued to the desk chair adjacent. I acknowledged the hint, but I didn't take it. I knew for a fact Kai had only expected me to keep my distance, because if I were to pin her down on this bed right now, she wouldn't protest. Hey, uh, Kai, about the slave girl, I'm not. I should apologize, Lucian. She interjected. It's just that. I don't want anything bad happening to you. She said, curling her fists against her lap. I've seen so much, my people have gone through a lot these past two years. Those shadow elps, they've taken everything from us. I've become overly cautious because of it. Our king isn't here, but our prince is, and I'd rather risk my life than to have yours in danger. Kai. She looked up at me, and I could tell she was serious about that statement. It's what I live for, to protect the king, to protect his people. I took an oath, and I take it seriously, Lucian. When I saw you that night on earth, so terribly wounded, on the brink of life and death, my heart bled for you. Is that why you kissed me? She froze, Kai taken aback by my words. I smiled. Heh, I'm kidding. I'm sure you meant nothing by it. You were probably just rattled, is all. It was a good save, but one I didn't like. I wanted to be frank with her, brutally honest. I could tell in the way those stargazed eyes looked back up to me, Kai wanted to confide and bluntly say what was so obvious. Something in me wanted to also. But. Kai. I just couldn't imagine her being by my side while I bred every eligible woman in the Baron's court without her batting an eye or feeling some type of way about it. Were you offended, Lucian? Her question forced me to straighten my back out, Kai now catching me with some heat. I rubbed the back of my head nervously, giving her a skittish smile. Heh, no, not at all. I actually enjoyed it, and was hoping. We can do that more. Shit, I caved in. More kissing. Either she was adorably gullible or strategically trying to put me under the spotlight with these questions. Kai was special, unlike any girl I'd met. When I was with her, she made me feel not so indestructible in front of the opposite sex. Not to say that she'd emasculated me with that save, but she definitely made me see her in a different way. She humbled me out. And with Kai, I couldn't work my charm like I did with other girls. My chest started to flutter, those beautiful exotic lavender eyes on me. It felt like she was unraveling me with them, and I couldn't leave her curiosity unanswered. So I fell into my own trap and chucked all reasoning aside. I unwound, letting that worried expression melt off me. Yeah, Kai, more kissing, my smooth voice begged her. The subtle shock in her eyes warned me, but I went for it anyway, taking her by her nape and leaning my lips over hers. Kai didn't fight me. She was shaking, bracing for that kiss, and when I locked lips with hers, she sent a wave of electricity through me. A gentle peck turned into much more in a flash second, and I found my tongue invading Kai's mouth. She had my blood rushing in one direction, and I wanted to answer this carnal calling between us. The chemistry was right, but the circumstances weren't. And even though I had fought all reasoning, it'd fight back, and I caught myself feeling distant with the idea of taking her tonight. But that kiss. Kai was basically on top of me, with one arm perched in between my legs, and the other behind me. I couldn't tell if she was trying to slowly bring me down with her small weight, pressing her lips into mine more, that subtle moan in my mouth rerouting my course. Because I was just about ready to taper off and knock myself back into my senses, but Kai wanted something. She wanted me tonight. I tossed her back into the sheets and straddled my legs around her, my lips on her while I brought us both further onto her bed. All of that heavy breathing and panting inside my mouth was making me lose my mind, Kai's body getting incredibly warm the longer we went at it. I slipped my hand away from under her arm once we got in far enough, Kai finally touching me back with those small slender fingers of hers. Underneath my top she went exploring, her fingers running along the grooves of my abs then back down again. I couldn't get why she was so nervous, those warm fingertips vibrating against my skin, before they locked themselves on my belt, Kai trying to unbuckle me. Lucian. She cooed, 
while my lips trailed down her neck. I sucked selfishly, feeling the heat between her legs give rise to her body's wants. And who was I to deny her? But then she said something that confirmed why we were here, something about breeding her. And that's not what I wanted to do. Kai, I started, reeling back from her just enough to talk to her straight. Why do we have to abide by the technicalities of everything? I asked. At first, it might have sounded out of place, but I was still trying to wrap my head around the idea of these tears. Why was I allowed to seed Kai, but not allowed to have her as my mate? The sun spirit's word is law, Lucian. But, I don't mind giving my body to you. That's the problem. I want more than just your body, Kai. I want you. She looked at me confused, like, the possibility of me actually falling in love with her was impossible. What about that feels so strange to you? I asked. She looked away from me, appearing awfully nervous. I put her on the spot for good reason, but her customs were in the way of us being together, and I wanted answers. I am just a warrior, Lucian. Part of the working class. While you're not only a prince, but a god. So? It is against the rules. It's against the rules to love you, but not against the rules to fuck you? She turned her head back around, with her eyes shimmering. Lucian, god of light, do you? Love me? Wait a minute, did I just say that? I peeled off of her in a hurry, stumbling back on my feet, trying to process what I just said to her. And no, that's not what I meant. She sat up on the bed, that shocked look on her face begging me for answers. So, you don't love me? I went numb at that question, feeling the heat on my face expose me. That's not what I was trying to say either. So you hate me, then? What? You refuse to breed with me, then you retract your love for me. I feel lower than the untouchables eternally resting beneath our feet. Huh. Wait a minute, what have I done? Had I somehow given her the impression that she wasn't worth my time? She got off the bed, feeling more closed off than before. Kai was disappointed, heading out of her bedroom before I intercepted her. No, wait, Kai, I demanded. We aren't going to trail off on those terms. I misspoke, all right? I'm sorry I made you uncomfortable. She furrowed her eyes up to me. Misspoke? Did you really, Lucian? Because... Because, I... Yeah, I misspoke. I had you on me, and I was catching a heart on. And, I know that sounds out of line for me to say, and I'm sorry for kissing you, but, I breathed, hey, how about we forget this whole incident ever happened, okay? Lucian. I don't want things to be awkward between us, Kai. I care about you. The same way you care about me. And if we've been instructed not to be together, then we won't. I'll respect the sun spirit's wishes. Fair? Lucian, I don't want to. An A knock fell on her door, Cecil's voice finding us. Kai, dinner is ready. Thank you, Lady Cecil. By the way, would you by any chance know where Prince Lucian went off to? Kai, don't. I tried knocking on his door, and I didn't get a response. Kai turned to me, trying to read the message screaming off my face. I didn't want the lady knowing I was here, locked up in Kai's bedroom. It would give her ideas, ones I didn't want to answer to. But when Kai's lost eyes fixed sternly on me, I felt like she was ready to answer in some type of spite. Yes, he is here. Oh, sweet Jesus. He's in there right now, with you? Lucian, are you in there? Why the hell did she sound like my mom who just walked into something nasty? I first held my breath, looking down to Kai timidly. I had to bite the bullet for this one and gulp down that wedge locked in my throat. Why yeah, I'm here, my shaky voice announced. And those empty few seconds of silence that came from her after told me everything I needed to know, she thought we were slamming each other inside. Oh. I'm sorry if I disturbed anything. She giggled. Please, take your time and... No, I will be down in a minute, Lady Cecil. Kai interjected, walking away toward the door, giving me a cold shoulder. Ugh, I was so disappointed in myself right now. Chapter 13 Hell, I felt just as bad as if I just flopped and couldn't perform in bed. I left Kai with a bitter taste in her mouth, my guardian angel under the impression that I didn't want to be with her. How the hell did I let her switch my words around like that? It was a misunderstanding, and I'd done a terrible job at translating that to her. I botched my entire mission tonight of trying to talk to her, and instead of breaking the ice, I'd encapsulated her in it. Good job, Lucian. Going back to the way things were was out of the question. Kai didn't say it, but she didn't have to, she was radiating that hostile energy toward me. 
No, hostile wasn't the right word, because if she were hostile, she wouldn't have taken a seat by me at the dinner table. I had followed Kai down after Cecil went fishing for us in our rooms. The lady insisted that I take the head of the long refectory table, and I insisted that I wouldn't. This wasn't even my house, I was just a guest. But of course, she hadn't seen it that way. Regardless, I expressed my concern for taking that restricted seat, and after she noticed how humble I was about it, she sat herself there instead. Because who was I but a lowly man trying to glue Lajera back together? Again, that whole demigod thing, I felt like I only embraced it when I needed an edge against someone. Someone like Isla. We had a wholesome spread fit for a king. Various types of meats steaming from the dinner table, fresh fruit, veggies, potatoes and grain, just about anything you can think of, really. Fresh from that farm I noticed a few meters away from the estate. Once the maids finished dressing my plate with food, Lady Cecil opened the floor for conversation, starting with Kai and I's relationship. Couldn't imagine where that curiosity came from, hmm, Kai. I have to assume you've been traveling for a while together, no? Cecil asked us, the both of us seated to the right of her, with her daughter Isla seated right across. Are you sure he isn't your Dasha? Um, no, we haven't. And he isn't my Dasha. Kai said while the maid poured her some champagne. Hey, are you sure you're supposed to be drinking that, Kai? I asked, my tongue slipping to mock her. Because it looks like you're barely 17. It was a bold and raw shot, but I wanted to force her to talk to me. Because right now she was putting on a show, being all passive-aggressive about us. I knew she had a grudge over her head. Kai was my partner, and I couldn't let a stupid misunderstanding grow a bridge between us. Fight pettiness with pettiness. It was out of character for me to stoop so low, but I was willing to for Kai. Regardless, I didn't get the reaction I was looking for, everyone looking at me in awe. Until Isla broke out in laughter. 17? Kai is over 200 years old. Isla admitted. And I spat out my bubbling gold elixir. 200 years old? How? The longevity of our people is truly impressive, depending on how well you take care of yourself. But in Kai's situation, she was blessed by the light with the ability to heal, and what seems like eternal youth. Lady Cecil answered. I'll admit, it's an envy I have of you, light warrior. There's no need to be envious, Lady Cecil. Kai said humbly. 200 actual years? Hoof, <laughs> spitting on the table already. Isla scolded. Pick yourself up, Lucian, and act like the man you say you are. Relax, don't get your tits tied in a knot, I spat back, Isla looking at me with her jaw on the floor while her mother tried containing her laughter behind that napkin. In what world did you think it wise to insult me like that? Oh, I'm sorry, are you also over 200? I said sarcastically. How old are you, Isla? I am 19, old enough to be respected in my own house. And I'm 20, older than you by one year, but in terms of rank, I could come at you any way I like. The nerve! Isla retorted, that lovely shade of red on her face pressing me. I was having my fun with her, teasing her to my heart's content. I will not sit here and be bombarded by this wannabe alpha male. Isla! Lady Cecil cried, before turning to me embarrassed. Please, excuse her. She doesn't know what she's saying. No mother, I believe I do. Then Cecil leaned into Isla's shoulder and whispered, Listen, Isla, if you don't want to sleep with the Prince of Light, I will be more than willing to take your place. Mother! Ha! Ah, Cecil wasn't as discreet with that comment as she thought she was. Isla shot up from her seat at that note, while Kai right here acted comically unfazed, slurping at her hot curry soup. I don't have to stand here and respect this man and bind with him to appease the sun spirit. Whoa! We are a little ahead of ourselves, aren't we? Already thinking about me in bed. I mean, come on, Isla, your mother is right there, I teased. You speak as if the only armor you wear and the only weapon you carry is that terribly ill-mannered tongue of yours. A tongue you want to get better acquainted with, I'm sure, I said with a wink. Oh my. Cecil cooed, clearly moved by my vernacular. Lucian, please, keep talking. Isla slammed her fist on the table, fuming. That's it. I refuse. Absolutely protest. Mother, I cannot mate with this man. This. This repulsive piece of filth. Isla. I deserve a man who is strong and powerful. A man who is worthy of impregnating me. Oh boy. What kind of a demigod pridefully waltzes into a baron's home completely absent of light? 
Of poise? Of rationality? Wait, was that a panic at the disco reference? She looked at me, hot off her sour mood, and then all of a sudden, that bratty look on her face tapered off into something shifty. Isla leaned into the table, opening herself to me, like she was ready to make or break me. Tell you what. Let's make a deal. We have a shadow elf infestation. Especially during the evening hours around the manor. Our guards have been swamped as you can imagine, making sure the perimeter is safe at all times. It's been too much to handle, and the Rasani manor could use a break. If you can come back powerful and clear my land, then I will. Have your child. Those words piqued my interest. I cocked my brow up, reeling over the table with my hands folded and my elbows around my plate. Isla, that's a pretty enticing offer. I feel like you are only confident to put your body on the line because you don't have much confidence in me. You say that like you don't think I can do it. I don't. She bluntly said with a witty grin. So I have nothing to lose. So do I. I countered confidently. Deal. Oh, marvelous. Cecil beamed. Your help would be greatly appreciated, God of Light. Mother, stop stroking his ego. Isla said as she took her seat. He is barely a Ligerian, let alone a god. He is half god, and all of Lucian is generous enough to lend us a helping hand, taking a detour on his journey to help us. You should be appreciative, Isla. Cecil retorted. Of course, that little red-headed brat scoffed, then proceeded to wolf down her meal, biting cold stares at me. Heh, what a hypocrite. What happened to those table manners, princess? I kept my mouth shut, my eyes on her too, while the rest of our dinner table engaged in light banter. For the rest of the evening, I gauged that although Isla dressed like a lady, she wasn't a stranger to wearing armor. The Baron's daughter was out there on patrol on some nights, defending her turf. She was a brick, with a mind like one too. Oh, I was looking forward to that angry sex later for sure. Chapter 14 That dinner invitation was stressful all around. But, at least it was fun. I gotta poke at Isla and make her sweat a little. I worked her like a fiddle, and once I came back a hundred times stronger, she'd lose that bet she'd so carelessly made. I couldn't wait to see her face when I dropped those shadow elps with ease. After dinner, I took a walk alone around the manor. At this point, the guards knew who I was, even though it felt like they had their eyes on me. I wanted to be a step ahead, and see what I'd be getting myself into once I returned to Rasani. There was a lot of ground to cover, but I hadn't seen anything too alarming. Then again, Isla had mentioned perimeter, the radius could stretch as far as the Rasani Manor wanted it to. But for now, I didn't want to get too close without meeting with the mother spirit first. That night, I went to bed, and fell asleep faster than I could start counting sheep. That delicious meal had given me the itis, and I was planning on being in a food coma until I woke up the next day bright and early. Next scene, the next morning seemed promising. But also eerie and looming. Could be because I'd had a nightmare about my last date, Nicole almost having had put me to bed permanently. She'd looked downright monstrous, with a face that was worse than any fictional beast I'd ever seen. With skin as dark as shadows, and blades for arms, ready to send me six feet under. I couldn't get rid of the picture of malice engraved in her vicious face, coming after me because of my association, Kai had confirmed there were others, that nightmare leaving me rattled. I rolled on my back on the bed, waking up an hour earlier than scheduled. My fingers strummed along the gem on my chest, trying to figure out if my father had an idea that I could have been a potential target. He must have known those shadow elps were on earth, right? Did he feel guilty and vanish because of what had happened to mom? He had given me his spearhead-shaped gem at my mother's funeral. And then, poof. No more dad. Kieran had left me with anger, regret, sorrow, and worry. I'd never gotten any closure, thinking that maybe those killers got to him after they'd gotten to mom. But now I knew that wasn't the case, because dad wasn't easy to put down, hell. He wasn't even fucking human, he just left me and Nana without telling anyone a damn thing, I didn't want to catch myself being angry at Kieran, but I was. Now that I thought about it, all of this could have been avoided if he had just been honest with the family, instead of hiding the fact that he was a freaking god of another planet. For Christ's sake. Though. I guess back then I wouldn't have been very open-minded to the possibility, seeing as I'd only seen a shadow elp recently, and I was still in denial at first. Now, I was just scared because I'd been convinced, treading cautiously, hoping that I'd be ready for when one sprung out to get me. After all, my survival here was crucial. I needed to avoid being the void's next meal. 
I got up, got washed, dressed, and headed out with my gear out the door. Down the hallway I didn't expect to see Kai, who happened to be closing the door to her bedroom as well, all ready to head on out. She gave me a glance to let me know that she acknowledged me, then shyly drew those gentle eyes away before she greeted me. Good morning, Lucian. Hey Kai. I beamed. I actually didn't expect you to be up so early. I couldn't sleep. Why? Not sure. Maybe I'm just jittery from the champagne, being underage and all. Ha, I couldn't help it, I broke out bawling. She had me in near tears with that dry joke. And coming from Kai, it was ten times funnier. She was always so serious, so I was glad she'd learned to open up with me. Her sarcasm was what I needed this morning, a dose of comedy. I walked up to her and gave her a hug, the top of her ivory hair barely meeting my chin. You're not still sour about what I said last night, are you? I was just messing with you, Kai. She didn't say a word back to me, merely holding me around my waist while her chest pounded at mine. I thought you were upset about what happened between us. You were being passive, and I wanted to break you out of it, thinking you'd lash out at me for being crude. You didn't take my bait, and I'm sorry if I gave you the wrong impression. I just wanted you to talk to me again, is all. Truce? Truce. I moved back an inch, Kai still hiding her face from me. I took her by the chin, lifting her beautiful eyes my way. And besides, you look great for 200. She smiled at me sweetly. Thank you, Lucian. She released me, but her face gave way to needing more out of me. I wasn't sure what, so I waited for her to direct me about it, but when she started to look like she was about to say something, Lucian, I... She broke her train of thought, Kai looking at me like I killed her puppy or something. What is it, Kai? She sighed, dropping her shoulders, and biting her lip at me. Nothing. Are you sure we are square? Of course. Great. Come on, I smell breakfast downstairs. I want to grab something before we head back out. Cecil made us these egg-filled buns, super fresh, and I was super grateful. I tucked away half a dozen for the road, and the kinder of the ladies made sure we were well fed with a breakfast feast that I'd never seen before. We ate in the backyard this time, where Cecil emphasized the importance of being around the sun in Legera. It was where all of their light powers came from, that, and the embodiment of the light's rays, being my father. Cecil also brought up a bit of her history, of how her husband had died two years ago during battle, and how bad Isla had taken it. Isla blamed herself for her father's death, because she was supposed to have been there by his side during the battle. Cecil said she had refused for good reason, because Isla was still training under her father, and was far from ready to tackle these shadow elves head on. It was why Isla made it her personal mission to guard her father's estate. She felt as though that was the best she could do granted the outcome of the attack. Cecil admitted that Isla had always been hard to get close to, but after Harold had died, Isla closed herself off even more. Personally, I understood where she was coming from, and didn't hold Isla's attitude against her. I already saw breaking to her as a challenge, but now that I knew what she was about, I could reach out to her better. A fighter at heart, much like my pops. She was giving me that warrior vibe, being as tough as nails. I then wondered if she'd be interested in joining Kai and I in our quest to purge this world of shadow elves. I imagined Isla wouldn't stray too far from her work at home, but it didn't hurt to ask her mother. Hmm, I cannot say I see her traveling outside of Rasani. Cecil replied, with a teacup along her red painted lips. Well, it was just a suggestion, seeing as she loves getting her hands dirty, I finished. While my plate was empty, my mind was full, thinking outside of the box here. But, if I did happen to get Isla pregnant, then I'd rather her stay put, outside of the field, and inside of her home. If you'd like, I can bring it up to her. She disappeared on me this morning. Probably out in her little playpen. She giggled. Her playpen? That's what I call her training hut. She trains almost every morning. Eh, gotta love a committed girl. Yes, if there's one thing that is strong about Isla, it is that she is very disciplined. She smiled. She gets that from her father. Cecil said, before she reached over the round table, taking my hands into hers. I know she can be a tough little nut to crack, but I assure you, my daughter is devoted to her people, and she will do everything in her power to preserve it. I only ask that you be patient with her, Prince. Ha, ah, you can just call me Lucian, Lady Cecil. She smiled warmly, and don't worry, I'm not easily offended. I actually like your daughter with her spunky and spicy attitude. Her face lit up. Enough to call her your mate? 
She gasped, reeling back into her seat, flattered. I'd be the happiest mother in all of Legera. To have my daughter as one of the prince's brides. Eh, em, well, we may be thinking a little ahead of ourselves, here. I claimed, my collar getting all stuffy. I am sorry, Lucian, I just got so excited. No rush, you have time to decide. For now, simply focus on coming back to us so you can clear our land and breed my daughter. I was glad she was so enthused about both of those things. Cecil later brought up a special light trait that I could get once awakened. She mentioned that she had a bright smile, bright enough to light up an entire room. I thought she was being modest, her smile could light much more than a room. But Kai told me she was referring to her light beam that she could emit from her mouth, hence that joke about her blindingly white teeth. Cecil didn't mention anything about Isla's special light powers, so I assumed she wasn't born with any special gifts like Kai and Lady Cecil. Now I was curious to see if this visit to the temple would unlock any special traits within these hybrid bones, because I was tired of being powerless. Oh, Miss Janie I. Cecil beamed, both Kai and I looking toward the direction she was turning to from the table. One of her housemates walked in with a crying baby in a swaddle, Cecil reaching her arm out ready to take the baby from her. Is it feeding time already? Yes, my lady. Janie I said, crouching over to hand Cecil the infant. She looked like she was a month old, I could be wrong. But when Cecil started to drop the strap of her top, I soon realized what she meant by feeding time. Her breast was engorged, with skin so revealing that I noticed those blue veins running down them. Her fleshy saucer Rila stared at me mesmerizingly, and while I knew it was rude to stare back, I couldn't help but lock eyes with that tempting nipple poking out of her dress. Lady Cecil, I didn't know you have a baby. Kai curiously said. Oh no, she isn't mine. Merrick's wife died three months ago from birth. I offered to help him raise his newborn. Merrick is one of my most trusted guards. I owe it to him to help raise his only daughter. That's sweet of you, Lady Cecil. I complimented, my voice coming off as sluggish, my eyes distracted by her huge nursing nipple. So very sweet. A lot of shadow elves tend to prey on the weak and vulnerable as easy targets. Because of this, he would never leave Yinchi's side. So I told him if he feels safer within these walls, he is more than welcome to bring his child here. Yenchi and I have grown close ever since. Cecil must have caught me staring, because her question jabbed me right at my chest. Are you excited to have one of your own in nine months? Huh. I lifted my head up toward her. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, of course. I'm excited, a bit nervous too, but mostly honored, really, to father so many kids. And you'll make a great father and lover to your mates, Lucian. Heh, it was time to pull that collar back again. If I didn't know any better, it looked like Cecil was flashing me bedroom eyes again. I might have given her a white lie back there, sure, I felt honored, but the excitement was somewhat fabricated. I'd be scared shitless for my offspring. They would be scattered throughout the districts. How was I going to protect all of them at the same time? Part of being a father meant protecting and providing for your family. I had so much ground to cover, and I felt overwhelmed with the concept of ditching as part of Kai and I's agreement. I wanted to be there for my kids. I didn't want to abandon my children like my father did. I had a lot to consider here, but I didn't want to scare myself by thinking too far ahead. After a delicious breakfast, Kai and I finally made our way out the front door, waving goodbye to Lady Cecil. Chapter 15 It was an informative breakfast to say the least, and I was more than ready to meet my destiny. But I was growing anxious and nervous, the temple not too far from us now. According to Kai, we had only less than 10 minutes left in our journey, so I continued to cram my face with those egg buns, hoping to eat my worries away. If you eat too many of those, you'll tire yourself out quicker. Kai warned me. I looked down at her modestly, not letting her warning slow down my stuffy chewing. But I'm hungry. She smiled. There's no reason to be nervous, Lucian. You are the rightful heir of your father's kingdom. Yeah? Does she also know that I'm only a demigod? Just a barista from another planet, with no ranks under my belt? Unless we are talking video games, the only monsters I've beaten were my chunkier prepubescent days of grammar school. She giggled. You will do fine. Just focus on- She paused, Kaiser's twitching. Mine did too. Something felt off, the wind suddenly shifting in the wrong direction. An eerie touch crept over my back, the feeling of something lurking, holding our pacing down. 
Kai instantly pulled out her bow and arrow, while I stood there like a sitting duck. Behind me, Lucian. She ordered, her light arrows ready to fire. I went behind her weapon, not even bothering with mine. If I didn't wield light, the only thing my BB would do was slow me down. We are being followed. And it was getting close, like a pulse growing beneath my feet. It was a looming feeling I couldn't shake off, but the longer I looked out the grove, the harder it was to pinpoint where this creep was coming from. I don't see anything, Kai. But you can feel it. It's a shadow elp, waiting to... She stopped short, the shadow finally revealing itself. Shit, I should say shadows, shouldn't I? Because about seven of them started crawling toward us on the ground. They snaked over the leaves and the grass, like thin long grabby tendrils ready to snatch us by our ankles. Kai capitalized, shooting a light arrow into them one by one. She managed to neutralize the threat when those arrowheads exploded, but my light warrior didn't look satisfied. Because after the smoke cleared, she realized more of them were coming. Where the hell were they coming from? I didn't see anything. I dropped on my ass, and Kai shirked back as the shadow elves started to fuse, creating a tower right in front of us. It was over nine meters and growing, about three times the size of Nicole. Just my fucking luck. Why couldn't it wait until after I got my powers? This one was all black, with antlers like branches on each side of its head. It had beady beaming white eyes like headlights, staring right into my fucking soul, with a silhouette that sat between skeletal demon and forest titan. It had no face, the blank slate giving me a touch of madness and chaos served with a tall glass of haunting fear. Overall, it was a monstrous looking piece of shit here to ruin my day. The pool of shadows it was recruiting off the ground added to its repertoire and that concept scared the crap out of me. It didn't occur to me that these shadows could separate and fuse of their own accord, making seven shadows growing into one big motherfucker. Kai quickly scooped me off the ground to gain more coverage, this S-class behemoth on the verge of solidifying. I was scrambling behind her, but I felt like we wouldn't get very far, not without fighting this thing back. So I dropped what was weighing me down, my sword, before Kai turned around, noticing something I couldn't see coming from behind me. Lucian, watch out! She cried, tackling me away from the shadow beast's trajectory. I only heard the whipping wind and caught the leaves and grass dancing about violently. Over Kai's shoulder, I noticed a tunnel burrowed in the ground from where I had been standing to disengage my weapon, the torrent chucking my BB halfway across the goddamn map. I held my breath, the power behind this one definitely different than what I'd encountered back at home. Capping out at a height like that, we couldn't have been the only ones who'd seen it, right? I mean, the thing was a fucking giant. We were still near Rasani, so where were the other light warriors? Why were we fighting this battle alone? I wanted to see exactly what we were up against, thinking trigger stats as I looked up at it. Instantly, a bright screen popped up before my eyes. Triggered stats. Name, unknown. Race, shadow creature. Class, S. Level, 162 experience, 8771162000. Points to be allocated, 0. Agility, 89. Brawn, 416 plus base, 400. Charisma, 2. Health, 16200, 16200. Shadow energy, 100%. No way were we taking that thing down. I was having a hard time accepting this fate. Without my light powers, this was hands down a gravesite. Unless Kai planned on escaping, I didn't see how we were going to get out of this alive. So I shut down those stats and made the decision for her. Kai, we need to leave, now. I begged, my eyes latched on the threat. That first gigantic step from the behemoth coming our way made my stomach tank, my eyes turning to Kai as I snatched her arm. I need to reserve my arrows? She followed in a whisper, calculating to herself. I'll need to play this more strategically. Are you seriously planning on fighting this thing head on? If we don't, we are allowing a shadow elk, especially a powerful one, to escape into civilian territory. I will not allow it. I don't know about you, Kai, but this thing seems like a team effort type of deal. We need an army. The Shadow Elps got rid of 60% of our army two years ago, remember, Lucian? I gasped, looking at the seriousness behind Kai's eyes. Her voice sliced me in two, and I could tell she meant business. Kai wasn't prepared to back down on this fight. But the fact that I was here was making her job a lot harder. Not only did she have to take care of that behemoth by herself, she needed to do so while protecting me. How could I sleep at night knowing I acted more like a hindrance to her than an asset? Okay, I breathed. 
you can fight this thing. But promise me, at the first sign of shit hitting the fan, you bolt out of there as fast as you can. All right? A warrior never flees a battle. She persisted, Kai flying off of me. Wait. Kai. I cried out, scooping myself up and into the battlefield with her. Shit, I must be out of my damn mind with this one. With every earth-shaking stomp it took, my mind went numb with fear. Even the birds in the trees escaped, the ground growing pale from this terrorizing threat to nature. Every bone in my body was telling me to back off, but I had a job to do here. I had promised Kai I would fight alongside her, to protect, provide, and persevere. And I had to summon the strength and courage in me to do just that. Sun God, Sun of Light. It bellowed, with a deep demonic voice so booming it partied the clouds in the darkening sky. You will meet your end. Oh great, so it knows me? Heh, glad you know who I am, but I have no idea who you are. How about we get better acquainted? Cocky, brazen, or maybe mad, at this point, I didn't care. I wasn't going to let Kai fight this good fight on her own. I was prepared to run around like a distraction. I'd always been fast on my feet, maybe I could use that as leverage in a fight that looked impossible to win. Whipping past the trees to circle him, I knew I was its prime target. I had a vague idea of what I was trying to do. The only problem was, I had no clue if it would work. I remembered Kai saying she needed to save her arrows, so I thought that maybe she had maneuvers that could do just that, while still being effective in at least bringing this guy down. It was safe to say that this thing had more options when it solidified. The fine line between its phantom and solid state was still foreign to me, but I noticed the lack of transparency in this monster's flesh, meaning that it was vulnerable to combustion. Just like Nicole was. I had to depend on Kai's intuition here, and right now, she was picking up what I was putting down. She didn't go for a direct assault, letting me distract the beast instead. Which wasn't the easiest thing to do. Those burrows the behemoth kept digging along the turf to clip my feet were quicker than I thought. They also covered a lot of area, flinging gust and debris with every foot stomping summoning. I did a few tuck and rolls, because hiding behind trees and scrubs was out of the question. It snapped through them like nothing, those sharp wind tunnels turning nature into ruins. I was quickly running out of stamina, but every now and then, I'd peek over my shoulder, catching glimpses of Kai leaping back and forth between trees. Shit, she was fast in the air. She made it look so natural, planting these strange duo triangle brackets in the air, working counterclockwise from me. I had no idea what was happening until those triangles started linking yellow beams between each other, Kai working her way toward me by trapping this beast in a circle. Ah, brilliant. I hope it was enough to cage him, though. Because this bastard was still on me. I think it was catching on, the forest shadow elk getting annoyed by my tactics. In one fell swoop, it chucked a wind tunnel so quick that I barely had enough time to register its size. It would be too close, I wouldn't have enough time to recover. The horizontal winds sliced the earth low, coming at me with full speed. I wouldn't make it, feeling my elbow getting clipped, the rest of my arm being pulled into the violent whirlwind. I was getting ripped apart, that second I blacked out I wouldn't miss. All I saw before my body slammed into this boulder was bits and pieces of my arm flying in that horrendous gust of wind. My own blood smacked my face, my body growing numb from the unbridled pain. The collision took my breath away, and it felt like my lungs were about to break through my fucking ribs. I didn't think about how being a simple mortal in this place could be so fatal, my ears catching Kai crying my name out as she rushed my way. Lucian. No Kai, finish the mission. She was being distracted, my wounded state serving as her kryptonite. The shadow beast capitalized, and decided to remove Kai from the equation entirely. It pulled its attention away from me, focusing on Kai approaching its old target. With one swing of its huge arm, it caught Kai, the attack leaving me utterly breathless. Kai. I croaked, my voice tapering off into a painful silence. I could barely lift up my head, but when I'd seen Kai flung off her shit like that, I felt something inside me burning. The rage I had to endure, watching as this beast changed course. You dirty motherfucker. I cried, my voice box on fire. Your bout is with me. Leave her out of this. It ignored me so bluntly, those piercing white beady eyes still focused on Kai. She tried to pick herself up, but she was hurting. Her face spelled disappointment, Kai beating herself up inside for being caught off guard like that. But she didn't get very far, and it seemed like she might have broken her leg when she fell. Kai. I screamed, followed by a battle cry to catch this monster's attention. Leave her alone. It was a wrap for me, once I saw that beast pluck Kai up on the ground like that, the light in me burned out. 
all the way out. Through my veins, down to my chest, straight bleeding out of my heart. I wasn't about to let Kai die here. Not for me, not for anyone. It was an awakening that swallowed me into this vortex, using my unbridled rage as its anchor. And I fed into this wild intrinsic power like it was doomsday, not giving a fuck who got in my way. My body glowed like a thousand suns, I was an outright lighthouse ready to explode. I felt the strength in me to rise up, the turf whipping violently from my light. I was sucking everything toward me, even the beast, who stood there with a daring look behind its eyes. It thought I was full of it, it had to. To stand there so boldly in the face of death. The hilt of my sword moving toward my grasp felt cold and satisfying. I had more than enough energy to swing that brick of a weapon over my head as I beamed through the terrain, as fast as fucking lightning. With one leap, I made use of Kai's levitating triangles, using them as boosts to soar me into the sky. I was ready for that death blow, watching as the beast started to dematerialize. Smart move, it was trying to save itself. But I wouldn't grant it the opportunity. With one faithful swing over my head, I felt the sun charge that bad boy up, my blade glowing with pure energy. I won't let you hurt her. A bilateral cleave from head to toe, my blade trembled in my grip, pouring heat between me and the enemy. Steam, dark smoke, and black blood sprayed me on my way down, a growl coming from it so satisfying that I wished I could have seen the look on its grimy dissever face when I killed it. But the power down. It was ridiculous. Once I managed to defeat the Shadow Elp, its body dropped, and mine did too. I was tapped out, there was no gray area. Because one second I was fuming with hot energy, and then the next, I collapsed like a fruit fly. Lucian. Kai cried, and I gritted my teeth. Shit, there was no way my body had tapped out like that, with my arms still ripped to shreds, and the blood on me still fresh. Man, that took a lot out of me. I grunted, before my face hit the ground and I passed out.